mobile phones on silent and away from the microphones would be appreciated. The oral evidence sessions that we'll hear today, members, we will have recorded by Ansard. If you're content that we'll do that for each oral evidence session. Agreed, Agreed. okay. Agreed. Uh, I have apologies from Patsy McGloom. Okay, members are content then. The draft um, minutes of the meeting that was held on the 30th of January are there. And if members are content with their accuracy, then I will sign Agreed. them accordingly. Agreed. 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 Uh, one matter arising, just the, de the department has written confirming the anticipated timings for the domestic abuse bill as set out by officials at the meeting on the 3rd of January and offering a briefing session of the draft bill. The committee thought that that would be uh, helpful. Um, that was before obviously the committee said that we would write to the department expressing our concern about the length of time that it would take to bring the domestic abuse legislation to the committee. Um, I know the Minister is hoping to meet with myself and Linda on Monday. So if members are content, I will, uh, along with Linda, orally brief the concerns to the Minister about the time frame that the Department are proposing, and then we'll bring that back to the Committee next Thursday um, to provide an update, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Item 4, then, is an overview briefing on the Courts and Tribunal Service, and if officials want to come, um, forward to the table, Peter Lunny, the Chief Executive. Um, of the Courts and Tribunal Service. It's pages 14 to 16 of your meeting pack and also pages 3 to 25 of your table pack members are the relevant uh, papers. I know we touched on some courts issues with the statutory rules um, on Tuesday. Um, Peter was able to talk us through that. So, um, Peter, I'll let you introduce your team. Save, sure. save repetition, but you, you are all very welcome. And um, at the when you finished introducing your team, if you want to, to give a brief overview, and then we'll we'll move to questions. Absolutely, thank, thank you, you, Chair. Uh, grateful for the opportunity to come to the committee today to brief you on the work of the Courts and Tribunal Service. Uh, I'm joined by three senior colleagues. I've got Elaine Topping, who's the head of Court Operations, Gillian McLaren, who's the head of Tribunals and Enforcement Division, uh, and Sharon Hetherington, who's head of Modernisation. In making my opening remarks today, I want to provide some background briefing about the service uh, before saying a little bit about our priorities, challenges and opportunities. As the committee will know, the uh, Courts and Tribunal Service is an agency of the DOJ, comprising around 700 staff working at 19 venues across Northern Ireland. 90% of our staff work in frontline posts, administering around 100,000 cases per annum uh, across all our business areas. We have a forecast annual expenditure of around £79 million pounds with £4 million of capital. Uh, and through the Court Funds Office, we manage over £300 million, pounds, which is held in court on behalf of some of the most vulnerable members of our society. We support 15 tribunals of various sizes, and we provide administrative support for the Parole Commissioners and the Planning and Water Appeals Commission. We are also responsible for the Enforcement of Judgments Office, which is a central facility for creditors seeking to enforce civil judgments in Northern Ireland. Our business plan sets out our strategic objectives and in delivering those objectives, whether through administering our routine business or through the implementation of our modernisation programme, our priority is to deliver high quality services that meet the needs of our customers. Turning briefly to the challenges that we face, budget uncertainty remains a concern. Over the last few years, the DOJ has faced some very difficult and challenging times in respect of funding. And like other parts of the DOJ, the Courts and Tribunal Service has faced significant austerity cuts. Since 2010, we've seen a reduction of 9.7 million in our funding allocation, while at the same time we've had to deliver a further 10.5 million of savings to meet inflationary and other in-year pressures. This year, we received a flat cash settlement from the department, which was a welcome outcome given the magnitude of internal pressures, and we received additional in-year funding for specific new functions or pressures, including legacy inquests, the substance misuse court, our modernisation programme, and changes to pension contributions. After many years of austerity, we continue to face financial challenges. While we anticipate being able to live within this year's budget, we will work closely with the Department to set a budget for next year and future years. In order to facilitate a more strategic approach to planning, it is important that we move away from uh, the one-year budget cycle to a multi-year approach, which will encourage a longer-term view to be taken. Maintaining our court estate is also challenging. There is a need for capital investment, not least in the North West, where Derry Courthouse is more than 200 years old. 
Recent failures of the heating and electrical installations in the Royal Courts of Justice will also require considerable investment to address uh, and uh, emphasises the need to look strategically at how and where we invest our, uh, in our future estate. The Courts and Tribunal Service has delivered a significant amount of change in recent years, and I'd like to highlight briefly a number of reforms or new business areas which we have implemented or are currently taking forward. Speeding up justice is one of the biggest challenges facing the justice system and is a priority for the Department. The speed that cases progress uh, is, uh, matters to victims, witnesses and parties generally, and we are committed to supporting this work through the introduction of case progression officers to support the effective management of cases in the Crown Court and by supporting the implementation of committal reform. We have supported a pilot to identify uh, and tackle causes of delay in care proceedings in the Family Court, and we are working with the judiciary to pilot the use of civil hearing centres to better manage civil business in the County Court. As part of the DOJ's problem-solving justice portfolio, we worked with probation and other partners to establish a substance misuse court in Belfast in April 2018. The aim of the pilot was to specifically target individuals whose offending behaviour is driven by drug and or alcohol misuse and to provide them with support to tackle the root causes of their offending behaviour. Acceptance onto the pilot programme was by way of clinical assessment and predicated on a guilty plea at the outset. It was open to 50 clients and ran for 15 months. The initial evaluation has found a significant improvement in abstinence, as well as a reduction in reoffending and the likelihood to reoffend. The evaluation also made a number of recommendations to improve the model, and they, these have been incorporated into a second phase of the pilot, which started in uh, July 2019. In February 2019, the DOJ announced an initiative to speed up legacy inquest arrangements and to deal with the outstanding cases. The initiative supported a significant expansion of capacity to clear outstanding legacy inquests and allowed for the implementation of reform proposals developed by the Lord Chief Justice. The Courts and Tribunal Service has established a legacy inquest unit to support the delivery of the LCJ's plan. The unit has a complement of 32 legal, administrative and investigative staff. In order to facilitate the preparation and hearing of legacy inquests, we will make facilities available for the digital sharing and presentation of evidence as well as other investigative software. There are currently 44 outstanding inquests relating to 71 deaths which have not yet been commenced uh, and which will be listed for hearing during a period of five years from April 2020. There are currently seven inquests at hearing, including those relating to the events at Bally Murphy in 1971. The listing of inquests is a judicial matter and on the 20th of November 2019, the presiding coroner, Mrs Justice Keegan, announced details of 10 uh, inquests to be heard in year one. She confirmed that the remaining pending inquests would be subject to active judicial case management, with the first reviews to be held in April 2020. Uh, she stated that she hopes to be in a position at that point to consider provisional year two inquest listings. The new Fine Collection and Enforcement Service came into operation on the 1st of June 2018, following the commencement of the relevant provisions in the Justice Act. The new arrangements provide for a broader range of additional collection methods, including deduction from benefits, uh, um, attachment of earnings and bank account orders. Where payment cannot be secured, cases are progressed to referral hearing where the court can consider options such as supervised activity orders, bank account orders, vehicle seizure or ultimately committal. The aims of the new service are to increase the number of financial penalties paid prior to default, to, uh, to reduce the number of fine warrants being issued to the police and to reduce the number of defendants being committed to prison for non-payment. While all these aims have been met, we believe that there is scope to further improve the effectiveness of the new arrangements, and we are working with the Judiciary, Department for Communities and uh, Revenue and Customs to deliver these. The Historical Institutional Abuse uh, Act 2019 received royal assent on 5 November. The Act provides the legal framework for the establishment of a redress board to receive and process applications for compensation from those who experienced abuse in residential institutions in Northern Ireland between 1922 and 1995. The Executive Office retains policy responsibility in this area and it is statutorily responsible for funding the administration, costs and awards of compensation, but the Courts and Tribunal Service is working to establish the redress board. Mr Justice Colton was appointed as President-elect on the 15th of November, uh, and the Interim Secretary was appointed shortly thereafter. The setting up of the Redress Board involves a number of strands, including finance, staffing, accommodation, IT, recruitment and training of panel members, and the agreement of rules and procedures. David Sterling announced on the 17th of December that the Board will open to receive online applications from the 27th of March. And it's anticipated that uh, panels will be available to sit from the end of April, with uh, the first approved payments to follow thereafter. 
To finish, I'd like to briefly mention our modernisation programme, which provides a framework to deliver change projects intended to modernise courts and tribunal services. At a strategic level, the work is overseen by a group comprising the Justice Minister, the Lord Chief Justice and the Permanent Secretary. The overarching objectives of the modernisation portfolio are to redesign and optimise service delivery models and processes to provide more effective services, to improve access to justice through the further adoption of digital and other online service delivery channels, to deliver a reconfigured and modernised physical court and tribunal estate to support new ways of working, to achieve a sustainable financial operating environment and to support staff and court users to work in a changing environment. Our future court and tribunal services will be built around modern technology, streamlined processes and buildings which are fit for purpose. We want a justice system that is much more proportionate to save citizens time. It's efficient and seeks to reduce the impact on their lives. The justice system needs to fully embrace technology. Facilities to initiate and manage certain types of proceedings online should be available for all types of business. Document and case management systems should replace paper filing and improve efficiency throughout the system. We will also seek to build on existing practices which allow legal representatives, parties and witnesses to participate in hearings by telephone and video conference. We will engage extensively with stakeholders to agree the vision and priorities for the modernisation programme and for the selection of individual projects which will be evidence-based with a focus on outcomes and benefits for service users. We have begun a number of preparatory work streams including a refresh of our courtroom technology solution across the estate, condition surveys for all our property assets and a review of all our IT systems. We are also developing a number of proof of concepts to allow us to test new functionality in uh, controlled areas before deploying them more fully in other business areas. These include a fully digital end-to-end -end solution for non-contentious probate business and a digital evidence sharing and presentation for legacy inquests. We will also develop a new remote evidence facility for vulnerable witnesses adjacent to Laganside Courts to replicate an important facility which to date has only been available at the NSPCC premises in Bishop Street in Derry. It is difficult in a short space of time, Chair, to fully articulate the breadth of work being taken forward by the Courts and Tribunal Service. However, I hope that this very high-level overview has been helpful and we are happy to take questions. Yes, thank you, Peter, and uh, it is helpful. Um, and certainly there has been a lot of good work that has been taking place over the past number of years, so I uh, commend you for that. Uh, uh, just a couple of questions and then I will bring in Linda. Um, the, the, the estate strategy is due at the end of March, um, and I note that that's to provide the evidence base for change. Is there any indication as to when, it, by way of the f number of assets that the court service has, where where the travel of direction is? No, I, at this stage, I think we are uh, gathering the evidence to, to understand the the condition of our various buildings uh, and to understand how we will invest in them going forward. Um, the estate strategy that will be published uh, in March will be a high-level uh, principles document which will set out the, the level of standard and facilities of, of accommodation that we want to provide at each, each of our venues. It won't be uh, a future configuration. I, I think once, once we have consulted and agreed on, on the standard of accommodation facilities that we want to provide, we will then look to try and map business flows and uh, the, the, the travel that customers will have onto that. Uh, to, to work out uh, the optimum configuration. But I, I do see that as a longer term piece of work because we are mindful as well that currently access to justice is characterised by physically attending court. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, a lot of the stuff that we are doing around trying to modernise our services and, and put them online and have a greater use of remote evidence facilities may help to mitigate the impact that uh, a, a more consolidated, albeit better equipped court estate uh, would, would, would offer. Yeah, I agree with that. If people don't need to be there and they can do it remotely, then why not do it remotely? Um, I certainly could give you plenty of evidence as to why Lisburn needs a brand new courthouse, just if, if you want to. <laughs> I'm happy to brief you more on that in the future. In terms of the, the digitisation work um, and that modernisation, um, and, and that's good, any conversations taking place about televising court proceedings or elements of court proceedings, even judgments from the Court of Appeal, for example? 
Uh, I'm not aware that that has been discussed uh, recently. Uh, I, I'm aware of the recent developments in, in England and Wales. I mean, that would be a, a policy matter between the, the Department and the, the Chief Justice's office. Uh, 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 but I, I don't believe that there's been any discussions around that, certainly in, in the recent years. If the policy was to do it from the Court Service point of view, you'd be confident that that could be implemented in terms of the uh, infrastructure that would be needed? I, I think, it, it, again, it would require investment in, in a different type of technology. We, we have done something similar uh, for uh, a couple of high-profile criminal cases where uh, we broadcast the proceedings to another building where witnesses and family members were, because, just because of the capacity. Um, so, so broadcasting uh, can be done, uh, but, but broadcasting for media purposes, again, would just need to be, we'd need to work through the, the structure of that. And how have you found the, the IT improvements in terms of actually improving the overall delivery of the service? Um, at the minute, they we're working on the, the re refresh of, of courtroom technology, uh, and, the, and the main benefit of that for us is that um, we, we have uh, experienced a number of occasions where perhaps uh, evidence from a vulnerable witness is brought in on a DVD or on another device and then whenever it, they, they seek to use it, it's incompatible with the system or the, the audio isn't particularly clear. Um, and, and I think that has resulted in cases perhaps unnecessarily being adjourned. Um, the, the new solution that we're putting in place will be uh, much more flexible. Um, when combined with the in-court Wi-Fi solution, it is what's called techn technology agnostic, which means that uh, if, if the prosecution or the defence come in with any device using any type of software, they will be able to log securely onto the courtroom uh, audio-visual equipment and, and there will be no issue about compatibility. So from that point of view, we expect to, to see significant improvements in, in reliability. Um, however, one of the other things that we wanted to do, as I said in the opening, was to, to look at uh, creating a, a new uh, remote witness suite uh, just beside uh, lag inside courts to, to do the same as we have in, in the NSPCC offices in Derry. That was one of the recommendations that came from Lord Justice Gillan's review of, of sexual offences, uh, and we're very keen to try and push that forward this year. That, that will be built into our accommodation in court service headquarters. Okay. Well, I covered the, the income issue and the financing of the organisation on Tuesday in terms of the, the fees and, and the moving to full cost recovery, so I don't intend to, to go over that ground with you. So, Linda? Um, just, I don't only have sort of one quick question just in relation, relation to the HIA, the Redress mm -hmm. Board. I know that um, we had, and um, I think Paul had asked questions in relation to this too, TEO have said that they will be financing that yeah. in terms of and have you got assurances in relation to that? Because that will be a concern that within departments where one department is promised from another department that there will be finance common that that then for one reason or another is not forthcoming. So just want to sort of gauge what kind of guarantees, because obviously this is something the TEO has to deliver on. Um, it's something that I certainly want to see delivered and I'm, I'm yeah. delighted to see that it's moved on so quickly and, and the justice actually have have moved so quickly in terms of putting somebody in place and, and trying to get everything. In, in relation to the, the funding, the, the duty on the Executive Office to provide the funding, to provide grants to the nominated department is contained in the legislation, so it, it's, it's probably as, as secure as it can be. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Paul? And just on that, um, so the actual setup of the dress panel, the management, the management of it, the organisation of it, and the basic apparatus of it moving, uh, is that executive office? No, the the day-to-day -day operation of the the redress board will the, the the redress board itself under the legislation is a body corporate. Yes. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the 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 management of that will be done by courts and tribunal service, just because of our familiarity of, of working with with those kinds of structures. Um, the interim secretary was previously the, the the head of tribunals and enforcement division, and and I asked him to move across to, to lead on establishing the the redress board, uh, and certainly um, the the staff that have been deployed to it. To date, a lot of them have come internally from, from courts and tribunal service, uh, and we're waiting for the remaining posts to be filled externally. Um, so soon we, we will be leading on it on a day-to-day -day basis. And you will pay their wages? Yes, and, and again, invoice that back to, to the executive office. Uh, the redress board is going to be based in Headline Building, 
um, and the panels will do their work in headline building. It's anticipated at this stage that uh, the assessment of, of, of compensation applications will be done on the papers, although there's, there's provision under the legislation for uh, an oral hearing in, in exceptional circumstances, if, if that is appropriate. Um, we believe that we can accommodate three panels sitting simultaneously in, in headline building, so that's, that's the, the approach that we're taking at the moment. And do you expect that money to come out of the existing budget, or is this part of the play with regards to the new deal, new approach, new approach, new deal, yeah, uh, well, I, I expect the, the, the money to come from the Executive Office. Um, I think there is a, there's a conversation for the Executive Office to have with, with uh, Finance and Treasury about where that funding ultimately comes from. But from our point of view, we will invoice uh, regularly the, the Executive Office for costs and outlay. Well, so, so I'm clear. You pay the staff and you pay the management of the redress board. But then you expect to get that invoice back? We build, it, we build it back to the Executive Office and, and we will put arrangements in place to ensure that both the, the invoicing and the, um, the forecasting is, is done uh, regularly so that there can't be any end of year surprises. Okay. Just so you know, uh, information, I have a question then to uh, Executive Office question time on this issue. Just for your own interest. Chair, can I just ask then about the Court of State? Uh, and I was worried there, very just nervous. Just before you do, Linda wanted to uh, we yes. follow up on the HIA and then I'll come back to you. Certainly, yeah. It was just in relation to the, the staffing issue there, where obviously you, you paid staff on TO. So, what about the backfill then? Because obviously, if you've taken staff from somewhere else and put them into those positions, there, ha there has to be backfill. Is yeah. that is that balanced out as long as TEO pay for the staff that you've moved, I'm assuming? Well, it is. I mean, with, with the, the staff that we've put into place so far was really just so that we could hit the ground running in terms of preparation. Um, but we, we do have a number of schemes running to, to fill the post substantively. Uh, and anybody who has moved sideways from courts and tribunal service to the redress board, we, we, will, we, we will have or will be taking steps to make sure that those posts are filled. And the process will be reviewed. Sorry, just... The process is going to be reviewed. Who does that review? Is that TEO or is that your say? Is that justice? Well, TEO uh, are the sponsor for the redress board, um, so we would expect them to take that forward. But we would obviously be be uh, inputting to that. Yeah. Thank for, you. For completeness, anyone else on HIA and, and just very briefly, um, Peter, can I just just to inquire that you're definitely on track to have the online applications by the twenty seventh of March. Um, which is important for many people, and that yeah, you, you will be on, on schedule to start sitting tribunals at the end of April? Um, yes, I, I, I believe we will be. We're, we're putting every effort into it, and, and we've been working very closely with the IT provider, Stiona, to make sure that, that the online application is, is available on, on the, the date that's required. Uh, we've also been working with the, the victims' groups and with the, the, the uh, interim advocate uh, on the shape of things like the application form, both the paper version and then whenever we have a, a working model of the online application, we'll share that with them as well. Um, but, but yes, I, I would be... Uh, confident that we will we will uh, achieve that date for going live um, uh, in, in one way or another. We will make sure that we are able to, to get applications in on the, the date that we have been committed to. And, and, and then sit at the end of April? Right? That's yes. Still the, the, the Chief Justice has identified, obviously uh, Mr Justice Colton is the President and, and uh, County Court judges have been identified to um, staff the panels. Uh, the Department of Health has also identified the, the other members for the panels. So, so again, we would expect that once the applications start to come in, there is a process to go through to, to serve them on the institutions and to get uh, the, the institutions' response on them. Mm. Um, and then once that has been done, they will move forward to, to uh, determination. So the panels, the panels will be available to do that. And therefore, could I ask Peter and, and through the chair, if there is a delay in that in applications or sitting for the first time, can we ensure that we are made aware of that? That Absolutely. there's going to be that delay. Yes, Gordon, just a yeah, just on that. Thanks, Peter, for your presentation. What type of person are you looking for in relation to qualification, experience, and competencies for the redress board? Are the legal reps or? No, the, for the panel members. Yeah, the, panel, the, yeah. the, the panels are chaired by uh, a judge. Uh, and then the other members have uh, experience around things that are like um, uh, emotional trauma and, and, and other health health care attributes. So that's why the Department of Health have taken the lead on appointing those members. So there are a range of skills and backgrounds you're looking for? They do, yeah. Not necessarily legal? 
No, no, the, the, the judge will be the, the legal member of the panel and they will be supported by um, lawyers, um, but that's just in terms of managing the claims and, and um, uh, uh, pr providing provisional recommendations around the assessment. On a, on a board, do you there's three per panel. Uh, there's the, the judge and two other members per panel, uh, and we hope to be sitting with, with two to three panels uh, from, from an early stage. Similar to benefits and so on? It is, yes. It's similar to, to the task structure. Right, okay. Thank you. Paul, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm just, uh, I got a wee bit nervous there when you raised your local courthouse. <laughs> uh, you do really have to be careful what you wish for. Uh, the last uh, Alliance Minister we had tried to sell off uh, the estate. Uh, and it took Claire Sugden to save and rescue the day. Uh, so, on that, uh, Peter, can I ask then uh, about any conversations you have had with the new minister around the estate, and if there is any inkling there at this present time about trying to sell off the estate? Uh, no, I, I haven't had I haven't had any discussions with the new minister around the court estate. Um, I, I'm not aware yet of, of her views on that. Um, there is a meeting of the strategic oversight group uh, for the modernisation programme uh, next week, next Friday. Next, next Friday. Um, and I would expect to be speaking to her before that about, about all aspects of the modernisation programmes. Okay. Is she appointed a SPAD yet? She has. Oh, well, there there is a SPAD designate. I'm not sure whether that. Have you met the SPAD yet? Yes. Have you had a conversation with the SPAD about the estate? Uh, no, I've, I've had a, a, a very high-level conversation with the SPAD about the modernisation programme, but not the estate. Okay. Because uh, for what it's worth, can I just say that having uh, been out of this place for the last three years, I've conducted all my own appeals with regards to tribunal, PIP, uh, ELA appeals, ESA appeals. And the two areas in my area, in Bellamina, where the, there's no doubt about it, the court room is the best place. It's courtroom three is as much like yep. a classroom as it is a court. Yep. The other one is a boardroom and it can be very intimidating. Plus downstairs yep. you are in a reception area and there's no privacy whatsoever. But in courtroom three in Balmena you have all the privacy you want. Yep. You have, you have uh, small rooms from either side. Uh, so I'm a great fan of the tribunals being held in courts, especially in Balmena. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Rachel. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, just on the substance misuse court pilot, I um, certainly welcome this, but I um, noticed you've put in about budgetary pressures. How much was budgeted the pilot and how much budget do you require for funding to continue into phase two for the remainder of this year? Figures yeah. for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was, um, the first pilot was a 12-month pilot. It went around for 15. Uh, it was 500,000. Um, one of the lessons Darren Peter mentioned that we did learn lessons, um, and I know colleagues from probation board are coming after me, um, who are much better um, skilled and, and know much more about that side of it. However, one of the main lessons learned was that needed, we needed longer, that the intervention of somebody who has a mixture of mental health and substance misuse um, matters and problems, we needed longer. So it's an 18-month month programme, 50, again, 50 people, um, and it's £750,000 for the 18 months. Um, Obviously, with everything, this is a pilot, so we would imagine that those costs, if and when we get to the point where we're rolling out further, that obviously there would be an economy of scale there in terms of individuals. But if you look at the, some of the societal benefits in terms of health um, communities elsewhere, you know, the, the cost is measured in that way. Okay, thank you. And just on that as well, um, these are adults that you were dealing with, or is there any under 18s? It's all people who the criminal court, yeah, adults. Okay. Um, on the mental health courts, then the mention of a scoping exercise to be complete, um, with a potential date of September next year. How much again for that pilot? Are you it, it, it hasn't been costed as yet. Um, we are working with. It will be much more because it is mental health, and that was another lesson learned from the substance misuse court, that there were people who maybe had an underlying mental health problem before the substance misuse. Um, it'll be much, a bit much more clinical intervention there. So we're working with colleagues in health as part of the scoping exercise, so that will help determine the cost of that. Okay, thank you. And finally, um, just with regards to the appeals uh, service, I don't agree with my colleague. I don't think courts should um, be the, pre the premises for benefit appeals and mandatory <laughs> reconsideration uh, issues there. But um, in terms of the executive agreeing to a programme of tribunal re or reform, and I'm just wondering, it says the transfer to DOJ didn't happen, but 
am I maybe I'm misreading this that the appeals are happening in, in courts with the court the, service? We, the, the statutory transfer of responsibility for uh, the appeals service uh, uh, didn't tran didn't happen. That, that still sits with DFC, but we administered uh, under an administrative agreement, uh, which we have done for for several years now. Uh, I think the intention would be that the statutory transfer should be taken forward, um, but that, that's that's really a, less, a legislative position more than a day to day issue. Okay. And finally, just in terms of the appeal service, um, appeal statistics used to be issued out publicly um, and breakdowns on whether or not a person was represented, whether if it, who, it was, who they were being represented by, private constituency officer, advice sector, so on, and also success rates. They haven't been published in a number of years. And I've been informed that this is to do with resource issues. Would, that, would I be uh, right in saying that? Or is there any intention to start issuing those again? Uh I don't know, actually. I, I think I, I'll need to come back to you on that. I, I, I wasn't aware of, of that, that publication or whether it's actually ours or DFC's. But it actually, it belongs to DFC, as far as I'm aware. But on some occasions, they do come to the appeal service for some of those statistics. Okay. But, but I, I, we'll, we'll come back to you with a, a, a that. formal Thank response. You. Thank you. Okay. Pat Sheehan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Peter. Just on the issue of the substance misuse courts, uh, you mentioned the valuation. Is that evaluation completed yet? Uh, yes, there, there was uh, an initial valu evaluation done at the end of the, the year. Um, that <coughs> was a first phase. Uh, I think we will want to continue to monitor the, the cohort going forward so we can get uh, richer data around reoffending rates. Can that be shared with the committee? The initial evaluation? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. you Gordon Dunn. Yes, thanks very much, um, Chair. Peter, you mentioned case progression officers. Is that a new post? Uh, no, we, we have had the, the rule before, um, but uh, there, was, there were certainly questions about the, the effectiveness of it in its original form. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've done uh, as part of the, the new uh, work on speeding up justice is we've revisited the rule and we've talked with partners uh, in PPS and police about how we can make it more effective. Uh, and by way of a pilot, we are now using that facility in, in three Crown Court venues. Uh, and again, subject to that being successfully uh, evaluated, we would uh, see that rolling out to, to all the other areas. And is this part of the Speeding Up of Justice initiative? Yeah. Yeah. And who do they liaise with, the, the officers? Uh, they they have their counterparts in PPS. Our, our officers in the court service have their counterparts in PPS uh, and also then with the, the PSNI, just the, the investigating officer. Uh, and the rule would be to uh, review the, the cases that are coming forward to, to make sure that actions that, that were previously identified have been completed. Would they contact the legal reps? On, on the defence side? Yeah. Yes, yes yeah. they would. Yeah. They chase things and obviously yes. progress. Yes, they would. Yeah. Sounds a good initiative. It is. I mean, I think. Um, no, I think we're all aware of the delays and the frustrations <coughs> that there are out there in relation well, to. We, we, we know that with, without the case progression officer rule, we, we know that there can be a, a tendency for cases to come back around for a further case management hearing, only uh -huh. to discover that, that certain tasks that were, were directed haven't been completed. So if we can, if we can deal with that all uh, in the margins, uh, it means that, that the, the time in the courtroom is more meaningful and used more productively. Do they have um, target dates or key performance indicators to work to in relation to cases? The Lord Chief Justice issued a new practice direction or a revision of the previous practice direction and that has set deadlines mm -hmm. for all parties within it. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that might have been missing. Peter mentioned in 2010 yep. with a similar rule, uh, as well as the fact that it wasn't replicated across all of the organisations. That was kind of one of the things that was really missing there, um, a, a strong judicial lead. And that has that issued in November. Um, so that has set out everybody's rule. And key response times. Um, and one of the other factors that um, Peter was talking about, we mentioned that delay, legal aid and, and queries around legal aid would be another aspect that has come out of this new pilot that Good. the case progression right. officer is able to address more directly um, with legal aid services in advance of, again, the hearing and maybe um, that way maybe cases could be adjourned. But it is, early, it is early and it's still in the learning and we're going to evaluate now, again, independently at the end of this financial year. Would the plan be to, to build on that in relation to progression officers? 
um, DOJ, I, I had a meeting with DOJ, sponsored by DOJ because it's part of Speeding Up Justice, but I had a, a meeting with the department only at the end of last week. They're very keen, subject to the evaluation, but it's positive as yeah. the interim evaluation would lead us to be, to um, roll out and look at extension. Good, okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, very, very quick one. Peter, I'm struck with something you said. Can I ask the question how often are court cases adjourned because of the built form and the apparatus within compared to the natural process of? So how often are they adjourned? How often are they adjourned because of the built form? A problem with the building or a problem with the sound? Um, compared to I, the natural process, procession of court cases? I don't know that we have uh, figures around that. I think anecdotally I, I would get word back if, if a case has been disrupted as a result of, of either incompatibility or equipment failure. Um, it, it's not... It's not particularly common, um, but, but on that individual case, it is very impactful. I mean, if you have yeah. vulnerable witnesses coming, it is something to be avoided at all costs. We, we do have uh, a Crown Court evidence protocol, which was drafted years ago, which, which provides for um, pre-hearing pre, uh, testing. And the idea is that the parties will come along and test all the functionality beforehand, check that the, 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 the evidence plays. Um, that's not always done. Um, but, but uh, I think the, the new the new technology solution will will avoid the need for that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Peter, sometimes I get confused about the different departments, so I don't know if this is right for you or not. Okay. Legal aid question: Would that be right? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I uh, well, the <laughs> responsibility for legal aid um, uh, would be with with uh, Deborah uh, Brown and, and Stephen Martin. Uh, sorry for for policy for it. Uh, and the administration of it sits with the legal services agency. So, our our role in relation to legal aid is just the only the only bit of legal aid which sits within the court service would be the judges granting in criminal cases. Okay, so so okay, so let me let me exploit that then if that's if, if that's the case because the Northern Ireland Legal Services um, Commission legal uh, bill has has been qualified for the year eighteen nineteen again, hasn't it? And yeah. and part of that qualification of that bill is the fact is that. And there's a number of reasons why it was qualified, but one of those were was fraud. Yes. Uh, and one of the recommendations, um, I believe, is that the tasking master for legal aid for the High Court should not be a High Court judge, but somebody else, a civil servant, possibly. Do we, are we looking into that? Are we looking into changing that? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm afraid I can't. Um... Okay, well, it sounded good asking the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> De Deborah's coming up shortly. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay, members. Um, Peter and the team, can I thank you very much for coming to the committee? I've no doubt oh, we will you. follow up in more detail yeah. uh, the, some specific aspects of the, the court service, but as an overview, that's thank you, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, members, um, the next item is then the overview briefing on reducing the funding. I will invite the team to come up. Pages 18 to 20 of your meeting pack, and then pages 27 to 31 of the table papers. Director of Reducing Offending Directorate within the department for the meeting. Um, let me introduce the rest of your team, just in case. Um, maybe you are the overall boss of this directorate, Ronnie, are you? Um, well, I'm the, the director of, I'm the director of Reducing Offending, but uh, Reducing Offending is about much more than um, just your directorate. my directorate, and that's why today I brought with me colleagues from well, across the district. I, have, I know who they all are, but I'll let you introduce them for me. Okay. Uh, Chair, first of all, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and brief the committee today on the work that we're taking forward across the department uh, and its agencies in an effort to reduce reoffending. I'm joined today by Paul Doran, who's the Director of Rehabilitation in the Prison Service, by Declan McGeown, who's the Chief Executive of the Youth Justice Agency, and by Dr Geraldine O'Hare, who's the Acting Director of Rehabilitation in the Probation Service. Some members of the committee will be familiar with the important work undertaken by the previous Justice Committee in bringing forward the report entitled Justice in the 21st Century, Innovative Approaches for the Criminal Justice System in Northern Ireland. One of the important principles that committee set out was to encourage the Department 
to build on the strong foundations which had been laid for collaboration between those working in the various aspects of the criminal justice system and to continue to provide opportunities for innovative thinking on creative approaches to the many challenges we face in justice. Today, joined by my colleagues from across the justice family, I want to briefly set out how we're attempting to build on the committee's vision for a criminal justice system that works in partnership to challenge individuals to address their offending behaviour and support them to live lives free of further offending. Each of the organisations represented here today will, over the coming weeks, have the opportunity to brief you on their specific work. But today our focus is on how we're working together to tackle the issue of reoffending. Our aim for the department or agencies are NDPBs and other partners, particularly those in the voluntary and community sector, is to align activities, support rehabilitation, improve outcomes for offenders and ultimately build a safer Northern Ireland through a long-term reduction in offending behaviour. Evidence shows that it's only by working with those who offend that we can make communities safer and reduce future harm to victims. However, the criminal justice system on its own, as the committee acknowledged in its report, cannot provide the knowledge, expertise or access to the services needed to truly reduce reoffending. There are a range of socio-economic factors which have been shown to have an impact on reoffending, including poverty and social deprivation, mental health issues, substance misuse, homelessness and a lack of educational attainment and employment opportunities. To give some context, of today's prison population, one-third have mental health issues prior to entering custody. 21% were homeless or living in a hostel. Two-thirds believe drug or alcohol contributed to their offending, and 55% of those in custody have a history of self-harm. These factors contribute towards the reasons why people become involved in crime in the first place, and they are often exacerbated through contact with the criminal justice system, leading to a cycle of offending which causes significant harm to victims and communities. Addressing reoffending not only means tackling these issues, but also creating positive connections back into support of families and communities so that they become enablers of change. Within the broad category of people who have offended, there are particular groups who have additional needs and so require further support in specific areas in order to address their offending behaviour. One such example is children, whose offending is often a manifestation of underlying issues, such as problems within the family home, disengagement from the education system, poverty and social exclusion. Likewise, women who offend often face similar challenges such as a history of suffering from domestic and sexual violence, and so a gender-specific approach to reoffending is needed to support them. I want to be clear today, both in taking this approach uh, requires major and sustained effort from across a partnership of government departments, statutory agencies, the private sector, the voluntary and community sector, and wider society, and that this is not a soft option. Addressing the underlying causes of offending often involves opening up aspects of the past that are deeply uncomfortable and painful, as well as giving people skills and ability to behave differently now and into the future. We also need to be realistic. Not every offender will desist immediately as a result of this approach, but the agencies represented here today believe strongly that we need to go beyond punishment for the crime committed to tackle what caused that offending in the first place. For every person who acts to turn their life around, there's multiple benefits, both in terms of the useful contribution that person can make to society going forward and in reducing the risk of creating further victims of crime. In order to reduce reoffending, the Department and its agencies have applied the core principles set out in the strategic framework for reducing offending and are taking on board the findings and recommendations contained in the committee's report. Our approach has been based on adopting a welfare-based rather than a punitive approach to children engaged in offending behaviour. Working together with the Department of Health, the Youth Justice Agency is developing a joint multi-purpose Curran Justice Campus to provide a short-term safe space at one end of the spectrum 
through to longer-term high-intensity therapeutic support for children with serious issues relating to mental health, substance misuse and childhood trauma. The Youth Justice Agency is also developing a new model of practice based on the Childer, so the child first offender second approach, including a focus on adverse childhood experiences, trauma-informed practice and signs of safety. Problem-solving approaches. Probation are playing a key role in the development and delivery of problem-solving approaches as a means of dealing more effectively with the root causes of offending behaviour. In a range of areas, including both domestic abuse and substance misuse, and an enhanced combination order, which aims to divert offenders from short term custodial sentences by offering the judiciary a community order with a more intense package of rehabilitation, reparation, restorative practice, and desistance. Probation are also undertaking early scoping work around the development of a mental health court, as you've heard already today. Probation are also engaged in the development and the delivery of innovative approaches, including social <coughs> enterprises aimed at improving the resettlement and rehabilitation outcomes for people who have offended. This includes resettlement mentoring schemes and restorative practice interventions in partnership with the community and voluntary sector. The department and its agencies are also working to reduce reoffending uh, in a partnership, uh, the reducing reoffending partnership aimed at managing offenders who are at a high risk of offending and reoffending, and who were causing significant levels of harm within their community. Restorative justice. Reducing offending directorate is leading on efforts to extend restorative principles to the adult justice system through the delivery of an adult restorative justice strategy. In addition, we are also working to develop a centre of excellence for restorative practice. Addressing the complexities of accommodation needs of offenders. Having a safe place to live is one of the most important factors contributing towards someone moving away from offending behaviour. Working together with the Department of Communities and the Housing Executive, we are working to approve the support offered to offenders on the return to the community. In addition, we have undertaken scoping work in advance of developing a strategy and accommodation. Improving access to and opportunities for education and employment. Increasing access to the readiness for employment amongst those who offend and ensuring that they are able to apply for jobs once they leave the justice system makes it much more likely that they will have the needed stability in their lives to refrain, refrain from further offending. We are working with the Department of Communities, Education and Economy to address economic activity amongst those in the justice system. Improving health provision and criminal justice system. A, high, a, significant, uh, sorry, a significant number of offenders have underlying health needs. The Department of Health and Justice are working to improve health outcomes for people in the criminal justice system, in particular collaborating with social care professionals to improve services for people in the prison service, uh, delivering a renewed person-centred approach to supporting people at risk of suicide and or self-harm. The committee in its 2016 report recognised the increasing importance across government and society that providing early intervention and support to individuals, families and communities and intervening early before problems become entrenched in the most effective route to uh, positive outcomes in adult life. We are currently working across the justice system to deliver a coherent approach to early intervention with the aim of creating a long-term whole systems approach in collaboration with wider government departments, criminal justice agencies and the voluntary and community sector. And finally, the focus of the prison service in its 2020 programme is on ensuring rehabilitation and is at the core of all that it does, so that it may effectively contribute to reducing reoffending. In order to achieve this, a programme to continue the journey of constant improvement within prisons has been developed in collaboration with our justice partners. In terms of reducing reoffending, this is included amongst other matters the recent development of a strengthening family relations strategy, the reintegration of probation staff within the prisoner development units, and the current development of a new justice wide gender informed strategy to support and challenge women, including girls in contact with the justice system. The Department has also been engaged in work led by the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland to develop ACE aware and trauma informed systems in <coughs> conjunction with colleagues across education, social care, health, 
and the community and voluntary sector. Within justice, we are working proactively to, to create the best environment to mitigate the re-traumatisation of individuals who come in contact with our system. Mr Chairman, in conclusion, I hope this sets out the comprehensive range of issues that the Department and its agencies are undertaking. Naturally, I'd be happy to take questions uh, from you and to provide any clarification that may be required. Okay, thank you, Ronick, um, for giving that uh, overview. Um, in, in terms of the commitment from beyond the Department of Justice, getting those other, whether it's in health or employment, how are you getting the link linkages with those departments so that whenever you're, you're trying to have that approach, that actually there's a requirement for them to engage? Because often you end up the department having to deal with it and, and others don't come to the table maybe the way that they should. What's been the experience of trying to, to get that cross-departmental approach to this work? Well, well, can I say, first of all, I think we are getting a cross-departmental approach. Um, we have put structures in place in each of the areas that I've outlined for you. Um, and if you take, for example, homelessness or uh, some of the other health issues, um, we now have structures in place that bring our colleagues in to work alongside us in a, in a committee format, I suppose. Um, and we are seeing, uh, you know, collaboration um, and we're getting the support, I think, at this point that, that we require. But there's still much more to be done. Who, who leads on that then? So whenever, uh, take health, for example, I know within the prisons, for as an example, whenever there's an, a, need, a need identified uh, and someone says, right, this is what is required, whether it's physical resource or financial resource, and these are the programmes, who's the ultimate decision maker that then triggers the other departments providing that support? Well, we now have in place a, a strategy group, which I jointly chair with a deputy secretary from, from the Department of, of Health, um, and that brings together a range of organisations. Um, and that work has been overseen uh, in the absence of the Assembly by the two permanent secretaries. Um, so it's through that mechanism that we can, uh, we can make things happen and we can encourage uh, the development of initiatives and, and programmes. In terms of the, the staff then, because obviously um, it's not without its challenges whenever you're engaging in this work, um, what kind of support is provided then to ensure that the staff and all of these different organisations have the kind of resilience that they need? Because they're, they're dealing with difficult cases. It can be emotionally, psychologically and physically demanding uh, as well. So what, what's the support that's put in place for the staff that's engaged in this work? Well, I mean, the different organisations um, can, can answer for themselves, but I would say, Chair, that we take the well-being of our staff extremely seriously, um, and we are working, for example, in the prison service um, at different levels in the organisation to, to provide the support uh, that staff need from, from governors uh, through the organisation. Um, and where there are specific needs, um, staff have access to counselling opportunities, for example, uh, that can give them additional support should they should they require them. I don't know if, if anybody else wants to comment, but generally. yes. So within probation, um, we use external support services through uh, counselling services, but also what's really important for our staff within probation is the whole health and wellbeing. We have. Um, uh, strategies around improving that and ensuring that staff uh, operate and deliver safe and effective practice. And I suppose the important thing around that is um, <clears throat> is the supervision of staff to ensure that staff are being appropriately supervised and managed, and that are not working outside of uh, you know their area of, of expertise, etc. So there's a, there's a big investment from probation in terms of the well-being of our staff, just as Ronnie has mentioned. And in the prison service, um, one of the four pillars of our prisons 2020 document is our people. We recognise that without people we can't do anything. And um, a very innovative Prisons Well project has been commenced under Prisons 2020, which has been well received by staff, although it remains a challenge. Um, I think another issue is, Chair, that um, we're aware now more and more of the impact of adverse childhood experiences on people who come into our care. And I know a number of the parties, including your own, have, have taken an interest in this. But equally, that applies to our staff. So our challenge, I think, is to build the resilience in our staff. So as well as training people to become aware of adverse childhood experiences, we've also been exploring ways to develop that resilience within prison staff. And again, Chair, for the Youth Justice Agency, 
first and foremost our staff on the front line or either social work or youth work trained. So they've gone through extensive training. We overlay that with a training programme that's quite extensive for our staff and to make sure of the staff wellbeing. We provide a wellbeing strategy there for the staff too to make sure that, that their wellbeing is, is, is as it should be. And, and in all of the work to try and reduce offending, is there a baseline figure that you're able to measure this against um, so that you know progress is being made? Well, the, the Northern Ireland Statistics Agency produces um, a report each year uh, on reoffending, um, and, the, and the figure uh, for 2016-17 for the overall reoffending rate uh, was 18 per cent. So, you know, that, that's the figure that we're, that we're currently looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been measuring this um, from around 2015-16. Now, we're not at this stage seeing a significant difference in the rate. Um, but you know it will take time for a lot of the work that we're doing to to bed in and, and start to have an effect. But but 18% is the is the is the overall uh, the overall rate. Okay. Thank you, Linda. I suppose to be fair, you're not going to see a difference in the statistics until it's more than a pilot and it's actually rolled out to the to to everybody, and everybody is entitled to the the services and benefits of it. Just a couple of of wee questions. I like everything I heard and what you said, right? It would it would be the kind of stuff that I'd want to hear. But I'm a wee bit concerned about well first of all, are you getting the finances and the support to actually be able to deliver on, on all of those things? And secondly, are there some and this is particularly for I suppose the, the prison service, are there some that are not getting that same service in terms of that you know that it's about looking after them it's about re-educating them it's about ensuring whenever they come out that they don't re-offend and when I, when I talk about some I'm probably speaking specifically about Row House because I've had some issues re I'm very new to the committee so a lot of this is new to me um, but I've been contacted already in relation to that and, and not by families actually by legal representatives who were not happy with what they were saying in there and had some concerns so I mean, obviously part of our, our, our work here and the, the work that's coming onto the executive is, you know, tackling the paramilitarism and we're not going to deal with that unless we deal with every single aspect of it. Um, and our, our prisoners are part of that and we need to look at, are, are we actually equipping them that whenever they are released, that they are able to see that there are opportunities out there for them, that there's a different a different life that that is open to them. I'll, I'll ask... I'll, let you answer those first. I have one or two others. Um, if I can deal with the row house issue first, um, I I would say that yes, we are addressing those issues. Um, if you look at our prisons 2020 document, um, you will see reference under uh, the separate uh, the services pillar to separation, um, and we are very committed to enhancing the provision that. Is, is in place both in the Loyalist and in the distant Republican uh, units within Bush uh, and Row House. We are currently implementing a report that was completed for us last year um, under the Fresh Start Agreement in relation to education and training for separated prisoners. Um, so we're working with the Belfast Metropolitan College to enhance the provision uh, for both the Loyalists and the, and the Dissident Republicans there, and that's been going on since September of last year uh, with some success, I would argue. Um, we have also put in place a, a very robust programme in terms of purposeful activity, where we've been bringing the GAA, the uh, IFI, uh, or sorry, IFA in, uh, and the Prisoner Arts Foundation, who are working uh, in those units as well. So there is a very full curriculum uh, that's now that's now in place, and I think that has progressed well over the past number of months. And I'll, I'll speak more about this next week when I'm here to talk about prisons. But but that that's certainly an answer to your question. Is I think yes, we are making progress. I, I intend to actually inform myself and not just take it from others as well. But I just I, I wanted to raise the issue just because it had been raised with me. But I, w I certainly will be looking into it further just to to inform myself about what's happening around that. Then just um. I forget what my other question was. Well, Pat, oh, the the font. Are you getting the font and the the? To, sorry, I had. We the, okay. to be able to deliver on what you, you've talked well, about. Well, we we have getting. received we have received the funding required to deliver the pilot projects that we're referring to in relation to problem solving justice. 
Um, we haven't got our budget, the department hasn't got its budget for next year yet. Um, so we're, it's not clear. Um, we are committed to continuing with those pilots, but it's not yet clear what funding will be available to further expand on that until we, until we get our budget. But certainly to this point, um, we, we've been getting the funding that we require for the, for the pilots. Uh, just kind of one question to you, services. Um, you said that all, all those that work within your department are either youth service or social work trained. <coughs> this is an issue I know that we had worked on um, previously, have and the, the PSA were working together on a number of issues, and I had raised with them that those who are working with young people, many of them don't have youth service training and they're social workers. And social workers with the best will in the world if they don't have youth service training, many of them are coming out of university and they're social workers for whatever they go into. So whether it's work, working with the older people, whether it's working with people with mental disabilities, whatever it is, that they don't have that specialist training in working with youth. And I think you need it. Because if you don't have that kind of training, working with young people becomes very challenging because you're not actually able to communicate with them in a way that they that they understand, that they appreciate. So is, are there any plans to, I mean, youth services would, I'm quite sure, be prepared to work with you in relation to this, in relation to doing some training of social work staff. I, I mean, I've worked with young people who are in care, and some of them said they had a better relationship with the police officers who were picking them up than the social workers who worked in the care homes. And obviously a lot of these young people are going to come into contact with yourselves at some stage. Unfortunately, that's what the statistics tell us. And I think that comes back to the fact that they don't have youth service training and they don't understand the issues that these young people have. To reassure you, um, as I said, we made a decision as an organisation that any, any member of staff who came in directly into contact with children would be either social work or, or youth work trained. There's a blend of that, and, and certainly what we continually do as well is refresh and update the training and work with, with the experts, including youth services across the board. And, and we actually bring in experts from across the water and, all, and other places to come in and tell us what's best practice out there. Ronnie mentioned in his opening remarks about the model of practice, and that's developing a model of practice that's fit for the 21st century, and, and, and it's a model of practice that will underpin the repurposing work that, that Ronnie also mentioned in his opening remarks, and that's to make it fit for purpose going forward so that our staff interfacing with the young people have the right skills and, and the approach to work with, with the children with the vulnerable needs that they have. And you've heard, for instance, ACEs and, and um, trauma-informed practice, science of safety. All of that is gathered up and, and, and is part of the model of practice. So to reassure you, our staff are very well trained and will continue to train to make sure that the, they've got the skill set for going forward and how the new dawn will look. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Pat, you carry on. So, yes, uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, Ron, I just wanted to ask you about the uh, rates of suicide in prison. I suppose not just in prison, but there have been worryingly high statistics of uh, prisoners or former prisoners who have recently been released from prison, taking their own lives. What sort of work has been done around that? Well, um, since 2015, <coughs> there have been 22 uh, deaths in custody, um, nine of which uh, we believe have been as a result of natural causes. So that leaves us 13 self-inflicted deaths. We've been doing a lot of work in the prison service along with our colleagues in the South Eastern Trust to implement the Towards Zero uh, Suicide Programme. But also we have put in place a very robust, uh, we call it SPAR Evolution Programme, that's supporting people at risk. Um, and we're seeing a very significant reductions in the levels of self-harm uh, in terms of the prisoner population as a result um, of the work that, that we're doing. But you know, every death in prison and every post-custody death is, is one too many. On the post-custody side, um, I've been in discussions with the prisoner ombudsman who investigates a post-custody death up to 14 days after the individual leaves prison and we've been working with our colleagues in probation um, and the court service who were here earlier and a range of others to try and put in place uh, mechanisms that will support and ensure people are supported when they when they leave uh, when they leave custody but there, there is an issue sometimes when people leave the custody of the prison service where we have been working with probation and others to tackle the, their drug addiction addiction issues 
where people leave prison um, and sometimes they think they can still, having not taken drugs for a period of time, can still take the, the quantities of, of drugs that they were taking before they come in. And we do, we do find that an increasing issue in relation to uh, post-custody deaths. But we are working, as I say, with probation, with the health service and with the, uh, the court service to try and identify and to support those who are at risk as they leave the prison system. Can I say something? Um, just to follow up on that with Ronnie, it is a, a serious issue here in Northern Ireland. We have the highest rate of self-harm and suicides in the UK. Um, and as Ronnie says, there's you know, significant causes of that. Um, and you know, we see uh, people who have uh, self-harmed and uh, committed suicide as a result of constellation factors, but serious drug-related issues are, are very much high on, on that uh, agenda. Uh, in 2018-2019, uh, we had 34 service users who um, died whilst on supervision. 14 of them were suspected drug overdose. So, um, I mean, without getting into the debate about serious drug misuse in Northern Ireland, you know, we know what the problems are. We know that there's a serious rise in uh, the types of the opioids that people are using, the heroin, crack cocaine, and that's where we need to, to, to actually tackle the problem. Um, but, you know, as Ronnie says, our, our interface and our links with health and other agencies, the voluntary and community sector, when they're coming out of prison, is absolutely critical and fundamental in terms of getting these people services and quickly. Well, is there any strategic approach being taken by all the agencies that need to be involved in tackling the, yes, the, the abundance of drugs on our streets? Yes, the um, Chief Medical Officer chairs the new strategic direction for drugs and alcohol in Northern Ireland, and it's just uh, the new strategy has just been uh, put out for consultation and launched. Um, and that includes all of the, the government departments, all of the agencies, and the voluntary and community sector, so that is everybody around the table. And the other arm of that is the research, which is really important. So there's a research arm of that in order to be able to collect the types of data that we know around the particular types of drugs and uh, you know, the incidence of suicide and self-harm. So there is a very high level strategic group that are working. Thanks, Thanks Chair. Paul Frey. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Can I just say, for like the last three years, I would like to thank the people here at uh, this committee today for the the interaction that I've had as a previous chair of the work you guys have been for the last three years in this what I call lean period, you've always kept me up to date, but, uh, informed, and I've always been amazed that with all my visits. I think I went with you one time, uh, mm -hmm. chair, uh, to visit the prison, maybe. Um, I'm always amazed at the work you do, and there's absolutely no doubt about it. It's hard graft, it's non glorious, low level hard, patient graft, and you guys won't get the front page for a success story. Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, you'll get the front page when something happens to go wrong. Usually through no fault of your own uh, in that regard. There are weaknesses, of course, but the work you do on a daily basis, uh, I think, is amazing. Uh, that's where the, the cuddly stuff goes right the window now, Ronnie. Uh, uh, in all seriousness, uh, I was always interested in the problem solving courts and justice peace, uh, how has that matured over the last three years? Well, I'm going to ask Geraldine to take that, but, but before I do, um, I mean, thank you for your comments about the work that each of the organisations do. I mean, I, I would want to echo uh, words of tribute to our staff, um, because I think whether it's prisons, probation or youth justice agency, people are doing um, amazing things and making a real difference in the lives of the people who are placed in our care. And that's what we're here to do, and I think it's important that we continue to, to develop that. I'll ask Geraldine maybe just to answer your question about problem solving justice. Yes, thank you. Um, so in response to that, it is embedding itself. Uh, it is still early days, there's no doubt. Um, we know that in order to tackle uh, offending and indeed reoffending, but ultimately to drive down the numbers of victims, we must take that other approach, and that is about getting upstream and targeting those very root causes. Paul has talked about the trauma that people experience. People that enter into the justice system do experience significant levels of disturbance, mental health problems. We have a very high prevalence of drugs and alcohol in the justice system, um, and that is why we must target those areas. So the problem-solving justice initiatives um, are going well. 
Um, the ECO, the Enhanced Combination Order, which the committee may be more familiar with, is a, a initiative which is an alternative to a short prison sentence of less than 12 months. We have had 501 people through that since the introduction of it, uh, which is really positive. Um, we have had very positive evaluations over the last three years since its inception. Um, in terms of, we cannot comment obviously on the reconviction rates because it's early days, but we, what we are seeing is the very positive outcomes beyond justice. So, for example, people are not going to prison for less than 12 months. They're remaining in the community. We see the benefits of that, such as they're able to stay in their homes, their families, their jobs, perhaps. Um, and through our uh, working with health and uh, the voluntary community sector, etc., we're seeing very positive lifestyle outcomes that sometimes we don't always report on, you know, such as... Um, uh, as I say, the restoration of families, um, people that perhaps hadn't had contact with families, seeing their children again, seeing children get into a learning environment, school, in that sense of, of uh, mindset. Um, so there's very positive things that are coming out of that. W one of the nuggets, if I may say, around the enhanced combination order is that everybody that is sentenced to enhanced combination order um, must go through a psychological evaluation so they get a mental health assessment and the reason for that is exactly what I've just mentioned too many people high prevalence of those co-occurring disorders within justice that we see so the mental health assessment at the outset will determine what their levels of needs are and risks are in terms of that intervention to drive that down 68 percent of the people on ECOs um, have a mental health problem and that's that's high that's that's very high but again it's not um, you know, it's it's common to what we know about the mental health prevalence here in Northern Ireland, but at least we know that and we're dealing with it. So that's a very positive development, and uh, the committee may know that that, that is currently rolled out in three uh, court site areas in Northern Ireland. The other problem solving uh, justice initiative is the domestic violence interventions. And along with our partners across justice and health, um, what we have targeted are those people that have not come into the justice system. So people that we know that uh, what we refer to them as the unadjudicated people, um, that we know they have a propensity to commit a act of domestic abuse against their partner. We see the children that are living in these environments in order to drive down that transgenerational cycle of domestic abuse. It's about targeting them early. So the, com the committee may be aware that we uh, delivered a pilot in the Western Trust to uh, men who were identified by social services as having that propensity uh, to act in a violent manner in a domestic situation. And that was a huge success. Um, and we've rolled out three more pilot, three more programmes in that area. 72% have completed successfully. So in other words, people haven't come into the justice system so that we are targeting them early and as a result of that successful pilot uh, we now are delivering and rolling out the unadjudicated domestic abuse program right across all the trust areas in Northern Ireland so it, it is seen as getting an early early intervention in its absolute true form and effective in terms of looking at those wider outcomes around health education and justice etc uh, the substance misuse court we've heard about um, it is an, uh, certainly a very alternative approach, but one that we know from the evidence that works. It is effective in terms of keeping people out of the justice system, ta uh, targeting and tackling their, their drug misuse and their health problems as well. We see a high rate of mental health problems within the, the substance misuse court as well. We're into our second cohort, and the eval early findings from that evaluation would indicate that uh, people are, are not committing further crimes, they're not taking the high levels of drugs that they were, um, and they're getting treatment and they're staying in treatment. Um, so there are early findings which are very positive, and it is true to investing in that early, early intervention so that we don't see the people coming in and peddling through the justice system time again. And it's, 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 it's working. Thank you. Uh, for a very comprehensive answer. Uh, can I ask about uh, the programme for government? It, it strikes me that justice is the one sector that could benefit from a truly uh, well-budgeted run programme for government, which is outcomes-based. Uh, Chair touched about the collaboration from other across departmental bodies. Uh, how well is that really working, and how much do you need an outcomes-based programme for government? 
Um, well, I think we, we absolutely need an outcomes-based uh, programme for government. As I said at, at, the, at the beginning, we can't do this injustice on our own. Um, and I think it has been a struggle in the early days to get people to realise that and, and accept that. Um, but I, I do believe we have made significant progress across government in terms of bringing people together to work with us in terms of what we're trying to do. I mean, the, the, the project that, that, um, that I am uh, co-sponsoring with um, a colleague from the Department of Health that, that, that Declan has responsibility for around the repurposing of woodlands, I think is a really good example of, of what we're doing. And I don't know if you want to just mention that briefly as, a, as an example, Declan. It absolutely is, Ronnie. I mean, at the heart of, of that um, initiative is, is to say that what we want to do across government is help vulnerable children and improve their life opportunities, which, which speaks to Programme for Government Target 12, Icon 12 at the moment. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to, to achieve. When we started on that programme ourselves within the department, and specifically the youth justice perspective, we knew the changes that need to be made to our custodial environment, which is Woodlands, JJC. But I was taken by how quickly health came to the table with us and education to say, how do we solutionise this? How do we work together moving forward? And that has given rise to this initiative that's called the Repurposing Programme. And what that is, essentially, is the Department of Health and the Department of Justice have a programme team jointly funded together who sit in situ and work to develop a new dawn, basically, and, and develop the services that we have for our vulnerable children to see how we can improve upon that and improve upon their life chances. It's targeted to, to happen by 2022, and the first stage of that is to bring forward design proposals over the first 12 to 18 months. We've already done that. We've signed them off at our most recent programme board, which Ronnie sang, chairs alongside the chief, well, the chief social worker sorry, in health. And I'm quite taken at the, t at the table is the Department of Education, the Department for Economy, the Department for Communities, all come to the table, all bring in ideas and helping us develop the solutions. So that, to me, is collaborative working at its best. And, and, and certainly, I think, going forward, it, it, it augurs well for, for, for where we want to get to with vulnerable children. Are you getting the right people with the right clout in the room with the right money? We absolutely are. Um, it, it's, it's chaired at, at, at Ronnie's level, um, and the representation at the table are senior senior civil servants around the table. And we also have alongside that a, a stakeholder reference group, which we've established, which is the, all of the key voluntary community sector groups and it's senior representation from that. And then alongside that, we have the children's commissioner who is there to mark our homework, so to speak, at key staging points to make sure that everything's on schedule. And I, I'm quite taken by how all of these people have come to the table and continue to do so to help us shape it. And I think it's quite impressive that even in the first 12 months, we've got to design proposals working through all of those stakeholders. Your final question to you. Uh, new Day gave new approach, looking through the justice areas. Have the authors missed a point somewhere? Uh, of course, support the PSNI increasing the officers to seven and a half. Legacy is an issue, taking power militarism, organised crime, but there doesn't seem to be anything specifically targeting you, you, the branches here. Is that a lapse? Um, you, you're correct in saying that uh, there's nothing uh, in, in the document in, re, in relation to us. Um, yes, I mean, I suppose we would have, we would have welcomed um, commitment, uh, but I don't think that should take away from the work that we're currently doing across across government. Um, I mean, we've, we've tried today to give you a flavour of what we're doing. I mean, I'm, I'm not here to say this is easy. Um, it is challenging when you're when you're bringing different government departments in the voluntary and community sector together, even the agencies within the justice family. It's challenging because we, we all have our, our, our different uh, priorities and our different key areas. But but it is it is working is the message that I would that I would want to, to, to bring to you. So whether or not there's a reference in the document, um, we are taking the previous committee's report seriously, um, and we're trying to drive that forward in a, in a collaborative way. Um, and we're beginning, I think, to see very positive outcomes from that. And you know the, the repurposing of woodlands. Um, in, a, in a relatively short space of time, I think will be a very visible manifestation of that. Okay, thank you, Chair. Gordon Dunn. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Ronnie, and your staff for coming in today. It's been interesting as a new member. Just following on as, as a North Down representative, just on the woodlands, the juvenile justice, uh, repurposing, which sounds a great term. Um, we would see that building and that facility is relatively new, but time marches on, I suppose. 
Will there be a need to reinvest there on that site, or is, is it early days? The, the building has been in existence for about 13 years. The plan is, which is still relatively new, uh, uh -huh. the, the plan is, is, is a repurposing not just of the bricks and mortar that are down in, in, in the yeah. Bangor area, which is not just Woodlands, but also Lakewood, which is the secure care facility nearby. But it's actually the services that are provided right across the region. And so the whole idea is that what we're going to do is look at how we can start blending together the services that currently exist and, and repurpose them better so that we can get the, be the best result for our vulnerable children. The ambition, the hope out of the repurposing program is that it would be as close to cost neutral as possible insofar as we already put a large amount, both ourselves and health and others, into these facilities and into the services across the region. So the idea is to make better use of that money and to target it better. Geraldine's talked about early intervention. We're going to put more money towards early intervention streams out in the community. And then on the site, we already have, I believe, first class provision on health, education, etc. within Woodlands. That will be the, the, the service that will be used to roll out for more of the children coming on to that site. So we will make use of that. Lakewood itself has education health as well. So it's almost looking at, with, without getting into the, econ the economics of it, economies of scale by way of those services and redistributing that money back out where it's needed out on the ground. So it, it, it might need a, a small injection, but the hope is to be as cost neutral as possible. The average daily population of Woodlands, JJC, 2018-19, 18 young people. That's right. It sounds relatively low. It is. It's it's a 48 bed facility, and back five years ago, um, the average city population was around 27. Um, we felt, and certainly I felt, uh, as the accountant officer, that. It, some of the children there didn't have to be there and could be better dealt with in the community with the services that there from my staff and, and others. And so the hope and the, the aim was to try and target early intervention programmes towards vulnerable children, first and foremost to stop them coming into the justice system if we could, and then if they did, however far entrenched they became, to try and have it as a last resort that they come to Woodlands. So yes, we've had a 50% fall in the average daily population, and, and therefore you could even look at it from an economic perspective and say, now there are 18 other odd beds in a 48-bed facility. It doesn't look viable from that perspective, yeah. but the staff and the services are there. The children are quite vulnerable and complex and, and need a lot of help from our staff. So we continue to, to roll out the model that exists with one eye in the next couple of years to repurpose that and making better use of those resources. But it has been a success story insofar as it's the early intervention, and, and particularly the stats will show that we've had a 54% fall in the number of children coming to the formal justice system. That means the population... It will follow, will fall as we get to Woodlands, and as Ronnie knows as well, that has been this case for um, Hyde Bank as well, where we've had around about a 60% fall of children, move, young people moving from Woodlands to, to Hyde Bank. So that's all because of the early intervention work that we're trying to do. Okay. The, uh, the Bangor site is the only custodial service? For young right. people, that's right. Yeah. But yet you have uh, people located across various sites. There are, no, sorry, the area teams strategically located across Northern Ireland. Aye, yes, that's right. The East Justice Service. Yeah, what we have is we have the custodial directorate, which is headed up by Bran Ingram, and that is the building that you see Woodlands down in, down in yeah, Bangor. Yeah. And then my director of youth services, Mary Ohi, she would oversee offices out in the community across Northern Ireland, and we have in around nine offices there spread across the region to provide services in each of the areas. Okay. Just one final thing, Ronnie, the, the Radar Centre has been in the headlines recently. Yes. Um, I was at an event two years ago, quite a lot of young people were there, and a lot of local representatives and so on, the police, and I think we're all struck by the facility and the potential use there is for it. Have you any interest in it in regards to future investment or, or use of it? I think it's a very positive facility. Um, yeah. I don't have responsibility that would sit Not under yet. Anthony Harbinson in the Safer Communities um, Directorate. Yeah. But, it, but it's certainly a very good facility, and, and I would encourage um, you know, schools and, and youth groups and others to go and visit that. I think that can only be mm. positive, um, because there they will get um, you know, a very good uh, insight into the work of the court service and the work of the prison service and the police and, and others. So I think I'd be very supportive of it, but I have no direct involvement with it. Okay, go on. Thanks very much. Linda, you want to Thanks follow up on Woodland? 
No, uh, sorry, it was just a quick question in relation to something else. So if there's uh, somebody else wants on, yeah. Rachel. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have two um, Gordon Stoll and my Woodlands questions. So um, in terms of restorative justice, uh, just a note there um, about the adult restorative justice strategy and the Centre of Excellence, would you have any further update on Mayor that? Paul, to speak on that. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll address the Centre of Restorative Excellence. First of all, um, members will know that that was recommendation A9 from the Restorative Agreement tackling paramilitarism. And it's a two-part recommendation, so it brings in the Executive Office as well as the Department of Justice. Uh, and that's been a, a bit of a challenge to us, and uh, that's why I know the Permanent Secretary a couple of weeks ago said that he welcomed now the uh, restoration of the Assembly and having a minister in place. However, despite the absence of an executive, we continued on and we had a multi-agency group working on, um, the, on the recommendation A9. Um, the, the, I think we'd asked previously that who was the membership of that group. So in addition to a number of directorates in the Department of Justice, we had the PSNI, we had the Department for Communities, the Housing Executive, Department of Education, Department of Health, and then we had the two community-based restorative justice organisations, Northern Ireland Alternatives and Community Restorative Justice Ireland. Um, and they were unanimous. Uh, and we also worked closely with victim support. They were unanimous that a centre of restorative action should have victims um, front and centre. It should be victim-centric. And to, to achieve that, rather than have a virtual centre of restorative action, they wanted um, a, a bricks and mortar, a, a, a building. So we, we weren't sure if we could take this forward in the absence of an executive, and we're, and as I think the Permanent Secretary said to the committee when he was here, and we were in, just in the process of getting legal advice on that. So we certainly welcome that the committee can give us a bit of direction on this, along obviously with the Minister. Um, I think it's a, it's a really good opportunity. I, I have seen personally the benefits that restorative justice can bring um, with a very much a, a victim centre to it. Um, and the, the idea of a, a restorative excellence centre would focus on issues such as training, um, developing capacity, practice standards and monitoring, building on the overall monitoring work that the Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland have done on various restorative justice organisations. Um, and that folds nicely into the uh, adult restorative justice strategy. Um, again, in the absence of an executive, we consulted internally with the, uh, government departments, but particularly with Victim Support Northern Ireland, and we now have a draft strategy, which we're just about to launch when the Minister gives us the approval to do so. Um, picking up on the point that Declan made about success, uh, I believe it's a success also in the reduction of the number of young people in the justice system, particularly in, in Woodlands. Um, people like the Lord Chief Justice, Criminal Justice Inspection in Northern Ireland, and indeed the Executive through the uh, Tack and Paramilitism Programme, have recommended the development of an adult restorative justice strategy. And again, as I keep emphasising, keeping victims front and centre to this, it could also incorporate some of the recommendations, for instance, in the Gillen report, which was published last year as well. Can I just add to that? In terms of the strategy, we, as Paul said, we do have that draft strategy ready. It will shortly go to the Minister for her consideration, and we, we will obviously, in the fullness of time, be coming to the committee with that uh, as well. Thank you. That would be great to, to see that. Finally, just in terms of offenders and improving access to opportunities, you know, sort of post custody um, or transitioning out of custodial care. Um, in I know you were saying about um, there's a good working relationship with other departments and Department of Communities, but one of um, the issues that is coming up in the advice sector at the moment is about the five week wait on universal credit and that um, applications for that is happening after they're leaving custodial care. So there still it's another five weeks on top of everything else. So I'm just wondering if there's any measures in place or could be looked at to maybe start that process earlier once, say, somebody is, has got a suitable accommodation and address and that kind of thing. We're dealing with a lot of people coming in who don't have IDs, they don't have anything, they may be moved around different parts of the country and, and won't be able to access any form of benefit or money, uh, which makes things a little bit more difficult in an already difficult situation. Okay. Paul, just to... yeah, I think that's a fair question and a fair summary of the current position. Um, in the spirit of the programme for government, we've been working very closely now with the Department for Communities, and we now have work coaches coming into each of the three prisons they're starting work with people in custody 16 weeks prior to release to ensure that when people do come out, they do um, get the right advice about finding employment, which we would strongly advocate. But if they were going back into the benefit systems, their benefits would be in place. 
We've also been working with the electoral office to ensure that people leaving custody have a form of ID that they can use, which can then be helpful for opening bank accounts and so on. But um, everything that the prison service does now is about rehabilitation. And I have seen a massive change in the attitude of staff from you know, the days when, when it was all about security. And thankfully now we don't have the same challenges, so now the focus is on rehabilitation. So that, you know, when people leave custody, that really is when the, the work should pay dividends. Okay, thank you. Okay, Linda. Thank you. Um, just in terms of the start of justice piece that you talked about, on off and that, I'm, I'm not opposed to a building, and I think restorative justice does work. I think it's actually a, a, a brilliant initiative, and I would love to see it being rolled out further. I know that um, Judge Marlon had talked about, you know, making it statutory in terms of the the funding, which I think would be a positive thing. That the, those groups and organisations wouldn't be having to reapply for funding all the time. And one of the things that we did raise with them, and this is in a previous life on the policing board, was concerns around the fact that it still needs to be community-led, it needs to be the organisations that are there, it needs to be community up, because that's why it's worked. That's why it has worked so well, is because it is the community working with the community that are most impacted. So I think that that's one thing that needs to be ensured. I agree with the victim centre, but again, that's why it's worked. It is the community. The victims are within that community. The perpetrators very often within the same community. So I think it's important that you know, whilst it's victim centred, it is community led. All of those restorative projects, I believe, work for that reason. Um, and I have another quick just thing on the domestic violence stuff. I think one of the problems, and I don't know how we address it, and you might have some suggestions, and that's really what I'm asking for, is that people don't see, even with all the work that's happening around domestic violence within this committee and many other committees, health and and all of the different agencies, PSNA, and everybody is doing a lot of work in relation to domestic violence because we realise the issue that it is. But I think that there is not a recognition out there in the wider community that it's a community problem, not a family problem. And I've seen this when I went to events and, and you ask people about what, what are the biggest issues in terms of policing within their communities. And room, rooms full of women, many of whom might be the victims of domestic violence, yeah. don't put domestic violence on their top five, even their top ten. So is there a way that, is, are there things that we could be doing as a committee, that the minister could be doing, that, that statutory organisations and, and bodies should be doing to ensure that the community realise all of the issues that you've raised here today about the impact, the knock-on effect in homes where domestic violence happens then for the children becoming involved in... Obviously, the parent is already involved in criminal activity if they're doing that, but the children then, you know, come into the attention of of the judiciary or justice system. I mean, is there the something or more? I mean, we the minister do? has it as one of her top priorities. Um, I have not had an opportunity to have a discussion with her about that, but but certainly will be. But I mean, Geraldine might want to comment in terms of that community yes. aspect. Thank you for that. Um, you're absolutely right, and it is so. It remains underreported. Um, and I think what needs to happen is uh, there is a wide range of strategies out there in terms of, you know, the voluntary community sectors, women's aid, health, justice, everybody is involved, education. But actually, you know, it is raising awareness from a very young age as well and in schools. Um, and I think going back to uh, Mr Frew's question about the early impact and the interventions and, and how that's embedded... Oh. Um, you know, it, it, this we, we see so many children who are um, witnessing and living in homes where there is domestic abuse. And the other issue that you raise around sometimes the community norms, um, that sometimes it is normalised um, and people still have a fear about reporting domestic abuse as well. And it's so that the communities are, are, are so aware and to be able to see the early warning signs um, and that children are educated as well. Uh, because what we know is that we see so many children that live in homes where there is domestic abuse and we then see that intergenerational cycle of domestic abuse. We see a significant increase in terms of child to parent and child to grandparent domestic abuse. So there's an awful lot that uh, is being done, but there's more that needs to be done at that very early stage within education as well. And, as you say, educating communities to educate themselves. Yeah. 
Geraldine, just something I picked up on that you said. I mean, the enhanced combination orders, there's been over 500. And I, I'm a fan of these. Like, like Paul, I, I've seen it. I'm absolutely with this. But you said we've no stats for reoffending from that. Why have we no stats for reoffending? Well, we, we've lots of statistics, but in terms of the actual reconviction rate, uh, there's a time lag on that for, for that to be reported. However, the statistics that we know are that uh, there's 500 people that have come through orders. There's 20% people, uh, a decrease in custodial sentences of 12 months or less. Um, from the evaluations, there's 85% of people on ECOs that are reporting enhanced uh, relationships and, and, and positive family dynamics, um, people that are getting employment, people that are linked into health. Uh, there's 68 per cent of people that are presented with mental health and drug related problems. We have lots of statistics, but the reoffending figure is that there's a time lag in terms of the, the overarching reconviction rates that come at a later stage. And I suppose that's not, I mean, it's, it's only part, that's only part of the statistics of everything else that you just absolutely. mentioned, but it's still an important part. Oh, absolutely. And in fairness, it is the measure that we will obviously be looking at, but I think what we can't uh, uh, you know, we can't just put that aside and, and wait for the statistics to come out, because what we're seeing is huge amounts of other outcomes that are really positive, that span across and touch other government departments and agencies, which are fantastic in terms of, you know, reducing the number of uh, people reoffending, and all of those very positive things like, you know, um, keeping families together, giving people employment, uh, linking them into health services, keeping them into treatment. So all of those statistics are there, but it's the, that, the, the reconviction uh, figure that we'll not get until a later stage. But uh, the, what we are doing at the moment is ensuring that we are keeping the appropriate data, because the data is so important from each of the agencies that there are the touch points to make that overarching outcome uh, um, to be able to, to realise that overarching outcome is, is multiple across all of the areas of people's lives that are um, in the justice system. And because of that perception by the members of the public who, who, who just see a, a, somebody who's on an eco and then yeah. you know it, it's over and he, he reoffends again and he goes through the social system again and then he reoffends. And it's that concern, I guess, that, that, and that's why I'm asking, is that, how we do we have that statistic? But, but I, I you know, fully appreciate what you're saying. So, you know. yeah, and in fairness, you're absolutely right, because um, that will come at a later stage. But it's been able to ensure that people understand all those very positive outcomes that make that bigger picture. Yeah. Um, and, and secondly, William, can I ask you, and I mean, it's only a view on this, um, but we've just finished the sentencing review and, and you know, what they're looking at in the sentencing review is, is punishment, protection of the public, deterrence, rehabilitation and reparations. And for the public out there, the deterrence piece is really important to them. Um, uh, and especially for around the likes of vehicle crime, for example, you know, they, they, they see people doing that. Is, is that. is that going to have an effect on... on on how you do business if at the end of this sentencing review you know there's a there's a mass uptake and saying stronger sentence, stiffer sentence, let's focus more on deterrence, let's move away a bit from from the from the rehabilitation. I'm not saying I want that, but I'm just saying that, you know, there's people feeding into this. Have you got a view on that at all? Well well I would certainly hope that people in looking at this would look at the rehabilitative work that's being done by the agency here today and by others. Uh, and would see the benefit of that. I, I deliberately said in my opening comments that rehabilitation is not a soft option, and, and it's not a soft option when you see it, uh, when you see it uh, in practice. At the end of the day, we as organisations are statutory obliged to take the people who come our way. So the prison service can't turn anyone away. So irrespective of the number of people who come through our gates, um, I'm clear that our responsibility is to work with those people, to challenge them and support them to change, um, and to do everything we can when they leave our custody, uh, to, to put them out better individuals than they, they came in. And that's the same for youth justice, and it's exactly the same uh, for the probation service as well. And that's why I think it's important that collectively that we're working together so that you know the early intervention piece that Declan talked about is in place, and we're seeing the impact of that at Woodlands, that we in the prison service have the programmes and support mechanisms uh, in place through our learning and skills, through um, all of the work that we're doing around equipping people for employment, and that probation then, when those people are leaving our care, uh, are ready to, to pick 
those individuals up and the others that they have responsibility for mm -hmm. who don't come into custody and to work with them. So I would hope all of those things would be taken into account in a sentencing review. Um, and I would argue that rehabilitation uh, is, a, is an extremely important uh, factor. We've talked about reoffending rates. Um, our job is to, to, to drive those reoffending rates down through the work we do to ensure that there are fewer victims created in our society. Yeah, thanks, Ronnie. Yeah, good, good response. And you're right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I do. Okay, can I thank you? Can I just raise one thing? Briefly. Yeah, well, I'll, 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 I'll say why. I'm just conscious of the time. I yeah. know some members are leaving. Missing four persons is an issue. When someone goes missing, the first thing that we are, can happen is report it to the police. And the police seem to be ending up with a growing problem, which they find hard to address. Do you feel that there's some need for some other agency to get involved or to help support the police in, in this ongoing problem of missing? Um, I think there are many demands placed on, yeah. on policing uh, and operational policing. Um, I think. Certainly, where people are going missing, I think that the police need the support of everyone, and particularly the community, I think, yeah, in yeah. trying to, to address that. But I, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all or a, or a one-answer to say it should be this organisation or that organisation. I mean, obviously, if, if the person happened to be someone that had left the prison system, we, we, would, have a, we would have an interest in providing any information we can. Again, if it was someone in relation to probation or youth justice, they would... They would as well, but I don't think there's any one organisation. Yeah, but, yeah. but I accept it's it's a big challenge for the police. I don't know if the supporting communities director have been before the committee yet, but uh, themselves the police might want to PS and I might want to tell you about the multi agency support hubs, which really address the issue of missing persons as well as other issues. Because the police have figures that six out of ten calls the police aren't about crime matters. So this is the multi agency support hubs have been a, an attempt to try and mm. deal with those societal issues rather than crime issues. Okay, something I'll, I'll work on. Thanks, Chair. Okay, folks, can I thank you very much for coming to the committee? Much appreciated. And we'll move on to the next item, and Deborah will make her way. Pages 22 to 34. Um, this session, I know, will lend itself just to very direct questions and answers. It's financial related. I appreciate the previous session is broader in its nature, but. Um, I just know that some members have indicated to me that they're against the clock, and so I'm keen to try and transact all of the business that I'm in the hands of the committee and its members. Deborah, can I welcome you to uh, the committee? Thank you. Um, and also Lisa and Louise, very welcome. So, Deborah, I'll hand over to you at this stage. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity to come along um, this afternoon. Um, I'm Deborah Brown, I'm the Director of Justice Delivery, um, and with me this afternoon um, I have Lisa Rocks, who is the Department's Finance Director, and Louise Blair, who is the Head of Financial Planning. So this afternoon um, is an opportunity for us to give you an introduction um, to the Department's finances, how the budget is allocated, and the types of issues that we're currently facing. Um, we thought it was useful at this stage to give you that high-level overview but of course, we will come back to the committee to provide further briefing as we work through the 2021 budget process. Of course, we very much value um, the committee's input to this, and we will engage with you throughout that process and take your views on board. So in terms of the approach today, you've got a slide pack, which we would like to talk our way through, and hopefully you all have that. Um, but before we do that, there's just a couple of other points that I would just like to highlight at this stage. Um, on the current budget, the in-year budget, just to give the committee reassurance that at this stage of the year um, we are on target to remain within our budget and do not foresee any issues between this and the end of the financial year. Um, looking ahead into 2021, we do face a number of pressures um, and we continue to input into the wider budget process um, to seek sufficient funding to make sure that we are able to deliver on the programme for government the new decade, new approach commitments, and maintain <coughs> our fine services. Now, we understand that the Finance Minister has briefed the Finance Committee and committed to make a statement to the Assembly setting out the 2021 budget around about the 9th or 10th of March. 
Bilaterals are currently being set up between the Finance Minister and Ministers in each of the departments, and it will be for the Executive as a whole to consider the budget pressures and the issues as set out in New Decade, New Approach, in the context of whatever funding is available. But of course, until that budget is set, it is very difficult for us to articulate the impact on particular areas of absorbing any pressures that we might find. But we will continue to engage with the committee on this um, throughout the process. So perhaps if we turn attention then to the actual slide pack itself. Um, so on the second slide, um, we have outlined here um, a colourful organisation chart. Um, so this is the overview um, of the department. So as you'll be aware, the department has four core agencies, uh, sorry, four core directorates. And of course, you just had a briefing um, from one of the areas and you've had previous um, briefings from other of the directors. Um, other thing to highlight here is the range of agencies that we have and the non-departmental public bodies. So the pink boxes are the five executive agencies um, and we are the department with the largest number of, of agencies, five of a total of nine across the whole of the NICS. And the green boxes are our eight non-departmental public bodies and of course they have a quite a large share of our budget and the largest of that would be the PSNI. Turning then to the third slide. So this gives you a very high level view on how the budget is actually allocated. You'll see, as I say, a vast majority of that budget sits with our non-departmental public bodies, 72%, about £747 million. And within that, of course, is the PSNI, about 68% of that, that would be £700 million. The executive agencies, they um, account for then the 23%, that's about £240 million. Um, within that, you've got prisons, youth justice agency, legal services, um, and the court service, and yeah, and the yeah, court service. So this slide then um, highlights that only a small part of the department's budget, five percent, is allocated to the core department and smaller bodies such as compensation services. I'm going to move then on to the fourth slide. So over the course of the year, we will engage with the committee around the monitoring um, process. Um, normally, there are three um, monitoring round processes each year, um, and those are the times which we will come back to the committee um, to engage with you on those particular proposals. But of course, we are happy to come back to the committee on any specific issues that they want to discuss. Um, as I said earlier, we will, of course, be coming back again um, on the 2021 um, budget. So now I'm going to pass across to Lisa, who will take you through the remainder of our slides. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Um, Turning to slide five. Slide five shows how the departmental budget is broken down. So we have a departmental expenditure limit, which you'll sometimes hear us refer to as DAIL. That's broken down into resource DAIL and capital DAIL. On the resource side, that's further split into non-ring-fenced resource DAIL and ring-fenced resource DAIL. Non-ring-fenced resource DAIL is for things like staff costs and normal running costs, or you'll sometimes hear it referred to as cash. Um, and we have a budget there of £1,077 million, pounds, or just over a billion pounds. There's also then ring-fenced resource DAIL, sometimes referred to as non-cash, and this is a technical type of budget which is used for things like depreciation. As the title suggests, it's ring-fenced and therefore it can't be spent on other areas, so for example regular ongoing costs like staff costs. And the budget there is £84 million. And then finally there's the capital DAIL budget, and this is the budget that we use for investment in things like IT, buildings and vehicles, and our budget there is £76 million for 1920. Turning then to slide six, slide six outlines the key features of this year's non-ring-fenced resource DAIL budget. So the key features of that were that the department received £11.3 million towards 2019-20 pressures, no cuts were applied, and the additional funding was used to minimise the frontline impact of spending areas absorbing their pressures. It also provided sufficient funding to allow the Department to take forward legacy inquest proposals in line with the Lord Chief Justice's plan. 
<coughs> in addition, the Department received £32 million towards employer pension contribution pressures. This was a pressure faced across the public sector following a pension revaluation. In addition, the PSNI received £31.1 million of Fresh Start security funding. This is in line with the Fresh Start Agreement, which set out £160 million across five years. Each year, the PSNI will switch elements of this between resource dial and capital dial, but it's initially drawn down as resource. Finally, the Department received £10.7 million for EU exit costs, of which the lion's share went to the PSNI, who received £9.8 million, which they used to recruit an additional 300 police officers, the balance of which was used across the core agencies for preparation. It's also fair to say the Department also had access to further fresh funding, first of all for tackling paramilitarism, where the Department has drawn down £7.5 million this year, and also shared futures funding, where £870,000 has been drawn down. Turning then to slide 7, this slide shows how the departmental budget is allocated. As Deborah has highlighted, the Department has a range of agencies and non-departmental bodies, so the budget is split across quite a range of areas, with the lion's share being with the PSNI, who you'll see there receives £703 million worth of funding. In terms of other key elements, um, significant shares of the budget sit with the Prison Service, Legal Services Agency and the Court Service. Then the core department, um, it's worth saying there, includes compensation services, which used to be an agency, but the £55 million includes £19 million in relation to compensation services. <coughs> and also just to note that the courts and the forensic budgets are shown net, so when the committee will receive figures in terms of budgets and percentages, for example, forensic science has a gross spend of £10 million, although you'll see it as 500000 on the chart and also the courts would receive about £30 million pounds of income, so we'd have gross spend of about £70 million. Turning then to slide 8, um, this is just a couple of very brief statistics um, showing that 68% of our budget sits with the PSNI, and coincidentally, 68% of our total budget is spent on staff costs, so we're very much people um, in terms of costs. So in terms of then uh, moving on to capital, on slide 9, key features of our 1920 capital budget, we received £76 million worth of funding, which included funding for the PSNI for EU exit. And funding was then allocated across prisons, police and courts, in prisons mainly for the new accommodation block at McGabry, and also for energy supply and other estates. And for police, that included vehicles and IT. Um, Turning then to how our capital is allocated on slide 10, you'll see that in slide 10 our main capital spenders would be police, prisons and courts as they make up most of the justice estate. Other areas receive capital each year based on the prioritisation of the bids. So for example you'll see the probation board received some additional money this year and that related to IT and some estate refurbishment. So that's an overview in terms of the 1920 budget, but looking ahead then to 2021, as Deborah says, we'll come back to the committee to talk further about 2021 as the process develops, but we thought it'd be useful to give the committee a flavour of the issues facing the department looking ahead to 2021. You will have seen that the department faces £56 million worth of financial pressures from the first day brief. And slide 11 gives a breakdown of what that relates to. As I said previously, given a significant amount of the budget is based on staff costs, £16 million worth of the total £56 million pressure relates to pay. The other significant element of the pressures relates to PSNI operational pressures. These include things like estate maintenance, injury and duty and IT. And then the remaining other category is spread across 14 different areas, so it, it covers quite a range of things. Um, £55.7 million worth of pressures is 5% of our departmental budget, so to absorb that level of pressures will have a significant impact, um, but that's what we're feeding into the budget process. In terms of capital, Dale, we submitted to the Department of Finance a range of detailed bids across all areas. It's very much a zero-based approach each year. 
but again, the most significant elements of that would be the prison estate, police estate and courts transformation. And we're currently in the process of ref refreshing those bids and we'll come back to the committee on them. Um, turning then to slide 12, it's important to say that in addition to the £56 million worth of known pressures, there's a range of potential significant high cost pressures. I say potential as there's much uncertainty in terms of what could crystallise and when and at what amount. Um, if they were to crystallise at significant levels, it's fair to say they would have to be centrally funded because they'd be too significant for the department to absorb. It's very difficult to put numbers against them, as I say, because either they're subject to legal proceedings or they're just very much at this stage very uncertain. But we will keep these under review and we'll update the committee as and when we have further information. But just to run through very quickly, um, the first issue is in relation to holiday pay, of which the committee may be aware, which is following the Burr Scotland legal case where there was a ruling where regular overtime created additional holiday pay entitlements. There will be implications across the board, but most notably for PSNI, who are appealing the judgment. There's potentially significant pressures on EU exit. Again, given the uncertainties around EU exit, this is subject to review, and we're continuing to refine that. But again, the most significant impact will be on policing. Then, in terms of legacy, um, there are a couple of elements to this. There are the legacy inquests, which were taken forward in 1920, but as we refresh the costs each year, then we will go back to the Department of Finance seeking further funding. And also then the potential litigation in the absence of a mechanism to deal with the past. And there's work ongoing within the department to scope those costs. But again, that's very difficult to quantify. In terms of compensation services, there are a couple of elements to this. The potential revision of the statutory discount rate and also the same household rule. And then finally, in terms of legal aid, this doesn't relate to the previous historic issues on legal aid, this is a very specific issue in relation to high value multi-defending cases. Um, finally then, turning to the commitments in the New Decade New Approach document, um, this slide sets out the areas of the New Decade New Approach which relate to justice. In many cases they are very difficult to cost because they are very much at an early stage, but again, if I were to run down quickly the justice areas. The document sets out a commitment to increase the number of police officers to 7,500. The Chief Constable has said this will cost £40 million per annum when it's fully implemented. In terms of legacy, the document says that legislation will be in place within 100 days to implement the Stormont House Agreement to deal with legacy issues. The Stormont House Agreement set out £150 million worth of funding. We have consistently said that that is not enough and it will cost significantly more. But the final cost will be very much dependent on what the legislation looks like. In terms of tackling paramilitarism, the Fresh Start Agreement set out funding until the end of 2021. A new decade, new approach reaffirms that commitment. In terms of the quantum, that was a cross-departmental programme for which there was £10 million per annum historically. In terms of the next four items on the slide, these are very much at the early stages and officials are working through the detail. We don't anticipate significant costs in 2021, however, potentially there could be significant costs in later years, and we'll keep the committee updated as work progresses. And finally, in terms of transformation, um, it overlaps with some of the areas up above in terms of things like policing <coughs> and committal reform, but there will also be the areas such as the prison estate and court modernisation. So that was just a very quick overview in terms of the departmental finances. Um, we're happy to take any questions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I know the work around the costings, the Finance Minister had asked for that as part of his discussions with Treasury in terms of what was contained in the, the new decade, new approach. So I appreciate some of that you're saying is at an early stage. However, is there a specific time frame in which that has to be provided to facilitate the Finance Minister's discussions with Treasury? There's still a lot of uncertainty around it. Um, we've provided what we have in terms of the things like the 40 million per annum on the police officers, but because of a lot of it is a work in progress, and there are other elements which also overlap with, for example, our capital bids for 2021, like the prison estate. So very much we fed in what we do know, but again, as we've highlighted, just the areas that we don't, and that those are just areas under development. 
In terms of the, the opening position for the current financial year, throughout the course of that year, I noted in the last monitoring round, I think it was approximately £3 million pounds was handed back. What, was that the, the total figure throughout the year or at the various monitoring rounds? Was there money handed back? Um, that was really the only money handed back. During the year, we actually um, had bid for, in the September monitoring round, we bid for some pressures in legal aid of £2.8 million, which we received. However, then during obviously the last few months of the year, things had moved on and we were able to identify easements and reduced requirements. So there was a the reduced requirement primarily from compensation services in terms of the, the easement at the end of the year. Uh, and, and was there any reallocations then within the department throughout yes. the year? Yes, there were. Um, we met internal pressures, for example, in terms of PSNI for injury and duty. They were allocated an additional four million during the year from within other um, easements being recycled um, and various other sort of smaller ones, that's probably the largest. Okay. And what about the PSNI's opening position? Did they hand any money back throughout the course of the year or seek additional funding throughout the year? Well, maybe if I just take a quick run through the, the PSNI budget. So they started off with 703 million and um, during the year they were allocated additional funding. Um, we allocated out the, the pension funding that we received during the year, so the PSNI got an additional £30 million for that. Then um, they also got the tackling paramilitarism programme money, they got an additional £5 million. There was uh, in year, on top of the opening allocation for Brexit, they got an additional £3 million. As I said, they had the £4 million for injury and duty. They got £2 million to take forward legacy inquests. And so there was, uh, overall, they, they had an increase of about £42 million, the largest of that the largest part of that being in relation to the pension funding. Okay. Okay, thank you. Linda? Um, just in relation to the HIU, and obviously I know that is dependent on the, the legislation, but um, I had raised this with um, Anthony and Carpenter, I raised it last week, around any you know preparatory work that's been carried out. So in terms of Obviously, we know the hundred and fifty million is not going to touch it. But are there any ideas of what kind of what kind of costs might be involved in it, or you know what kind of money the finance minister needs to be bidding for in relation to the HAU? And I mean, obviously, one part of it's money, but the other part of it is the the training up of people and and, and all of that, and the time that it's going to take to do that. So, is that part of the problem around not knowing what? what the costs are going to be involved and and how many people are going to be employed into it and all of that. What, what are the issues with, with being able to suppose cost that? I suppose Anthony and Access to Justice colleagues would be more able to answer the question. I suppose it's back to you until we know the period covered in the legislation and what, what would be put in place. It's almost impossible to cost. Big Betty. Well, thank you, Chair. I'm going to ask this one again. I already asked this for somebody else, <laughs> and I was the wrong person. But the Northern Ireland Legal Services Commission have had their accounts qualified, um, uh, and part of that qualification is 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 because of fraud, um, and there's other reasons, but because of fraud, and and some of that might even be in, within the system itself. I mean, what are we doing to rectify that? Okay, so the reason for the qualification is because we are unable to estimate in any sort of way the level of fraud and error within the accounts. Um, so at the moment what we're doing is we are working with some specialists um, drawing up from expertise in DFC who have gone through this process before um, and there are sort of three areas of, of error that you can find so um, there can be um, official error so that's basically whatever happens within the, the organisation itself then there's applicant error and then there is um, the professional error that could happen as well so we're working our way through this, so there's testing of cases to find out if there are any levels of error. If there are um, things that we don't know, then you end up with what's called a deemed error, so, um, so you're looking for more information, so then we have to look back into the records and see if we can prove that the payment was legitimate, there was no overpayment or underpayment, etc. So we're currently working our way through that process um, and working with the audit office, so that's why the accounts are qualified, because we're unable to give an estimate of fraud and error. Uh, and, and one of the recommendations um, was that the, 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 the taxing agent for the, the high courts shouldn't be a high court judge is, is, uh, and, and, and therefore should be a civil servant. Is that being looked at or is it not being looked at? Um, Bearing in mind, he, he writes the, the, the certificates for the legal aid mm. for the high court judge. 
no, for I'm, the High Court? Mm, I'm, I'm not too sure about that. I mean, the whole issue about the, the taxing master is quite a, a complex area and any changes would, would need some primary legislation. Um, we are looking at some cases that maybe wouldn't need to go to the taxing master. Um, we're looking um, at criminal appeals to the Court of Appeal um, and standardising um, some of the standard um, two main types of family law. So there are some areas there that we're looking at, but I can get you some more detail on that. And, is that, uh, uh, and that's interesting. So you're talking about family civil cases yes. and legal aid in regards, in regards to that? Yeah. Okay. Um, th thank you. Um, second one is you, you, you drew down 7.5 million for tackling paramilitarism this year. Uh, what is that out of? What was, the, what was the budget for that for this year? Was it is it ten or fifteen million? Um, it, this year, I suppose there's been, on average, it was expected to be about ten million per year. Um, however, at the start of the program, um, there was obviously it took a while for things to ramp up. So I think overall. Um, I'm not sure if the exact figure we can come back to because it's across departmental. It doesn't actually sit within the Department of Justice. Uh, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, trying to f I'm trying to find out, I mean, are we using what we're entitled to use? And you're absolutely right. And I remember when it started because we didn't use it and we, we had to go through a fight to get it all carried on to the following year because yes. uh, it was a year-on-year -year budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it would be really useful to find out if, if we're using what we're entitled to be using. We're certainly using what we have drawn down and what we have bid for. We are using, but as Louise says, we don't manage the overall programme. No. Right. So, but... but what, what you need, we're getting is no... Absolutely, yeah. and I suppose, as far as I know, to the end of this the 2019-20 financial year, the Tackle and Parallelism programme has allocated about 31 million, so there's about 18 million or so, 18, 19 million, that they would need for next year, as far as Good. I know. Brilliant, thank you. Well done. Thanks very much for your presentation. I have the... The Northern Ireland Audit Office uh, report on managing legal aid in front of me, 2016. It's a while ago, but some of us weren't here for some time, so I appreciate it. It's maybe a bit dated. What is the, the total legal aid bill, or what was it there for the, the last year, 2018, 2019? So um, this year, um, 88 million. Um, before we did some of our reform, legal aid bill was sitting at about 105 million. Not a bad answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Twenty fourteen. Yeah, twenty fifteen was one hundred and six point four million. Yeah. So you you're going the right direction, but um, prior to that, the year before that was one hundred and five point six million. Now this report, I, I appreciate it, is somewhat dated. There were a number of recommendations, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, one of the things that they talked about was the use of expert witnesses. In the, the need, there's a need for reform in that. There's no set fee structure for this work. Fees payable onto the General Authority have not been revised since 1992 of an upper limit of £120 an hour. The agency must pay any amount claimed up to the limit. Uh, we have examined a number of legal aid ca case files and found that different experts charge different rates for reading and reporting on, for example, the same medical records. What has been done to address that issue? That was one of the recommendations of the report. But I have to admit, I have not brought with me. I do have where we are in each of those recommendations, but I didn't bring them with me, but I'm more than happy to come back to you on that particular issue. Right. The other thing that's been touched on by Dougie and, and some others is the internal controls in relation to prevention and detection of fraud. Yep. I'm sure you're, you're fully aware of that. Yep. Um, it said here in the report, German, that where there are flaws in an organisation, counter-fraud strategy is, is expected. Uh, it talked about internal controls in the agency have been relatively weak in detecting fraud. The primary control remains the vigilance of staff to process claims identifying anything suspicious, plus a small amount of simple base checks which are largely undocumented, which I find rather alarming. Um, it also talks about uh, there was reliance upon the staff vigilance has been undermined by the quality of the agency's case management system. Um, and finally, it talks about 1% sample check was being carried out, 1%, mind you, to all payments in 2013. The agency determined that this testing should cease. It has not proven to be effective. Despite this, it was continuing to perform these checks. So there are a number of major issues there and non-compliances that 
needed to be addressed. So can you give us an assurance that there's been significant progress well, there has been a, these issues? Yeah, there's been a lot of progress done on the fraud and error, as I say, and learn the lessons from our colleagues um, in DFC are working alongside us, which is around those issues that you're saying about compliance, the testing and the checking and then following up on them. So I can give you some, as, as I said, I'll come back with you with more detail on each of those recommendations. Are you aware of it? I suppose it would take a significant culture change really to address these issues. Are you aware of that within? Oh yes, yes, the absolutely. I mean, the system, the the, the legal aid. Um, they we we brought in the legal aid uh, management system. It, was brought in um, in July of this year. The IT system? Yeah, the IT system. So that um, is a huge part of our transformation programme um, in the Legal Services Agency. Um, we have also um, done some restructuring around the staff um, and how things are being done. Um, so again, that is to helping to change the culture and to change the behaviours around some of those issues um, and improve some of the checking um, around some of the... the what about fraud areas. awareness training? Uh, are all staff subject to fraud awareness training that would be dealing directly with us? Oh, yes. They are. Is it mandatory? I'm not sure if we use the word mandatory, but it would be encouraged. I mean, anyone who's working in that field will have had the training. They should have had Yes. OK, so there has been significant reduction in the budget. Would that be fair to...? That's fair, yes. Yeah, to say from, from this report. OK, thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thanks, Chair. OK. No other members. Um, just to clarify then, Minister plans to make a statement... 9th or 10th of March, I think yeah, it I think was. That's the date, yeah. Which I'm assuming is before Treasury's budget at Westminster. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I take it it's a two stages, you know, because if there's any on a consequential uplift to Northern Ireland, he will have introduced a budget, which then within a matter of weeks may well have significant changes to yeah. be made to it. Is that your understanding? Yeah, that's our understanding. And of course, you know, we outlined the monitoring round. So the next point at which we would have that money allocated is possibly the June monitoring round. But we'll wait and see what the process is around this and how, if we do get additional money, how we would have the ability to spend that in the absence of having gone through the June monitoring round. And are you expecting one year budget or two years or...? I would have, or imagine this is probably a one-year budget, but I am your guess as good as mine. Yeah, I suppose the only thing would be the new decade, new approach talks about the multi-year PFG yeah. aligned to a budget. So you'd imagine timing-wise, with the lead into that, you would expect perhaps a one-year budget followed by a multi-year. Assuming that's Westminster-led, they would need to be allocating. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll move on. Item 7 is a statutory instrument that it is for noting, um, pages 36 to 68. This was the department advised of a UK-wide statutory instrument, which is the carriage of goods and use of transportable pressure equipment regulations 2020, and that's being made at Westminster. Um, it's being made in the exercise of the powers that are conferred through Section 8 of the European Union. Uh, Withdrawal Act 2018, and it addresses a failure of retained EU law to operate effectively and other deficiencies arising from the withdrawal of the UK from the European Union. The Northern Ireland Health and Safety Executive has responsibility for the carriage of dangerous goods legislations, including explosives, explosives which are a class one dangerous goods, the responsibility of the Department of Justice. Officials have been working closely with the Department of Transport to ensure that necessary EU exit amendments can be made to the carriage of explosive regulations in Northern Ireland 2010. The Northern Ireland regulations mirror the Great Britain regulations and the amendments are technical in nature. They don't represent a change in policy or place an additional burden on industry, but rather ensure a continuation of the regulate, regulatory framework after exit day. And in the absence of the executive, the drafting of the statutory instrument the Department of Transport proposed including amendments to the relevant Northern Ireland legislation. Within the statutory instrument that's being taken through Westminster, the Minister of Justice agreed that the amendments can be made by a UK-wide statutory instrument, uh, which was then laid in Parliament on the 4th of February this year. It's not subject, therefore, to any Assembly proceedings, and it's there for me to ask members to note the statutory instrument of the carriage of dangerous goods and use of transportable pressure equipment amended, amendment EU exit regulations 2020, unless 
further information or clarification is required, I'll ask members to note it. Great. Item eight, the <coughs> examiner of statutory rules uh, published her first report of the 2019-20 session on the 3rd of February. Uh, the report covers 35 negative resolution statutory rules that were considered by this committee. <coughs> at its uh, meetings of the 23rd, 28th and 30th of January and one statutory rule that's subject to draft affirmative procedure that has not been considered yet by the committee as the department intends to bring forward a replacement statutory rule. The uh, examiner uh, has no issues to raise in respect of the technical elements of 31 of the 35 negative rules that the committee considered and agreed that we had no objection to subject to the examiner's report. Members are content. We'll note that the examiner of statutory rules has no issue to raise with the technical elements of each of these statutory rules. Noted. Noted. Um, the examiner has drawn attention to four of the negative resolution uh, stat rules that were laid by the department in that they breached the 21-day rule, and in each case the department has expressed regret, set out the background to the reasons for the breach in correspondence with the examiner, who has indicated contentment. Uh, with the explanation for the breaches that were provided. So, again, I'm just asking members to note that the examiner is content with the explanation from the department regarding the breach of the 21-day rule and has no other issues to raise with the technical elements of each of these rules. Unless members wish to raise any of the matters further, then we will note it. Uh, also, to note the intention of the department to bring forward a redrafted stat rule subject to draft affirmative procedure to bring the witness charter into operation, which is to replace the draft statutory rule that was laid on the 9th of January. And the uh, examiner has also provided a summary of the Department of Justice submission in relation to the making of statutory rules in the absence of ministers and asks members to note the position unless there is any more information required. Noted. Right. Forward work programme, pages 150 to 155. It was agreed at the meeting on the 30th of January. Uh, the briefing on the LCM, the, the Legislative Consent Motion for the Criminal Finances Act of 2017, will now be an oral evidence session with the date for this to be confirmed by the Department. Uh, again, just to remind members that the Chief Constable is attending the meeting next Thursday to outline the PSNI budget position and key policing priorities and challenges. And uh, if members can provide any areas that they would wish to flag up in advance of that meeting uh, by close of play tomorrow to the committee staff, that would be appreciated. So far, we're looking at the radar centre and relaunch of child protection disclosure schemes are some of the issues that members have brought to Christine's attention. So, any more issues? Uh, people don't need to. They can bounce it on the chief constable at the time. That's, I'm sure they'd be capable of handling it. But Linda, um, EU exit and legacy. Yeah. I was thinking, sir, just to say, state management of police stations, basically. Uh -huh. Okay. So, is it, is it in order to ask chief constable to give us an update on particular investigations that are going on? I, I have no particular issue. With anyone asking questions around the entire remit, obviously he'll be he will guide us if there's particular sensitive things that he can't go into. But I, d I don't intend to put can, restrictions. Can on we ask them for an update in the investigation in the Muckamore and hyponatremia? Okay, so tomorrow close of play. If there's other issues that members want to raise, um, just let let the team know, and uh, we can give the the chief constable a heads up on on those issues. But again, members are at liberty to, to ask whatever they the wish next week. I'm pretty relaxed about that. He mightn't be, but I am. <laughs> um, correspondence. Then there's three items of correspondence. Um, if members are content, we'll action the items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet. Agreed. A um, couple of items on, under Chairman's business. I've got an invite just to attend a Prison Officer Association meeting um, to discuss some prison issues, so I intend to take up that invitation. Um, I've also a request from the Children Law Centre for an introductory meeting, which again... Um, I intend to, to take up. 
and also there's a request from the chair and chief executive of the probation board uh, for a meeting which i will take up as well any other business if there's no other business then our next meeting is today week two o'clock same room we'll adjourn the meeting This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee.